this meeting to order. I encourage folks to take their seats. For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on COVID-19 Recovery. Um, I'm joined here today by my colleagues, uh, Councillor Frank Baker, who's uh, the sponsor of this matter, um, also at District 3, uh, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Aaron Murphy at large, Councillor Ruthie Lujan at large, um, and uh, Council President Ed Flynn, District 2. This hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Um, we'll be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing, so if you're interested in testifying, um, if you're here in person, then you can sign up um, down at the, um, over there, there's some papers to sign up, and I know many of you are signed up already, which is great. Um, if you are not here in person and you want to testify virtually, you can email ron, R-O-N dot cob, C-O-B-B, at boston.gov for the link. Um, and if you do do that, just make sure your username is the first and last name that you gave us so we know that it's you. Um, and for folks, I see several folks who are on the Zoom already, just know that we know you're here, we can see you here in the chamber, um, and when we do get to the public testimony portion, we'll be going to you and you'll be able to unmute. So thank you for joining us virtually. We're, uh, uh, um, we're doing lots of uh, hybrid hearings these days, and uh, it's exciting to be able to have people in both respects. Um, we do ask that folks state their name and affiliation or residence, and just limit your comments to a few minutes to make sure that we can hear all the comments and concerns. Today's hearing is on docket 0265, an order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend a grant fund through the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund in the treasury of the United States established by section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA, awarded by the United States uh, Department of the Treasury. Um, and uh, what, what that gobbledygook means is that the city has um, a significant amount of um, funds from the federal government that are kind of um, uh, unspecified. And so the question is, how do we collectively use those funds to best recover from the pandemic? And so that's something that the council and the mayor are going to be talking about in the coming months. And so the proposal here is for um, what we're going to hear about today to be considered in that set. So I'm going to, before we go to our panelists here, um, give councillors an opportunity for some brief opening remarks starting with the uh, sponsor, Councillor Frank Baker. Thank you, Council Bach, for, for having us, um, having this unorthodox hearing here tonight. Um, basically what the field house means to me is an opportunity with um, opera money, and opera just being, being a sort of a broad-based term for the federal money that's been given out to cities and towns around the country uh, um, to be able to heal after what happened to us with the COVID. Uh, um, so we actually have money. And to, to be someone that grew up, probably take me three baseball throws to hit this site here from where I, where I grew up. But five, <laughs> probably five, five. Um, to be sitting here and actually to have a proposal like this that's not just gonna um, allow teenagers to come in and, and heal and do positive things, it's gonna allow generations. My, my vision is little kids all the way up to mom and dad and grand, grandparents. Um, the way that I look at Columbia Point, which is the name of what it is, we call it Harbor Point now, but it's always been Columbia Point to me. Um, <clears throat> we have an opportunity now. Columbia Point used to be um, the city's dump site. It was a site for, um, back in World War II, there were, there were Italian prisoners there and many other uses that have, that have happened there. Now, in the new Boston, we have an opportunity for this peninsula to to train towards the future to and, and not just train people that already have training to take the kids out of our neighborhoods from Bowdoin Street Fields Corner Savin Hill Pleasant Street all around St. Margaret's there's 50,000 kids that live in a I believe a three-mile radius to their South Boston also 
I, I think this will be the first project for us to be able to really realize the potential out on the peninsula, which will be a peninsula that, that will train and enhance life. This building, this building will do everything from allow our kids to play on fields when there's 15 feet of snow on the ground, like what we had in 15, to be able to teach them how to nourish themselves, not only with food, but also with positive um, reinforcement and, and, and positive activities. Um, I, see, I see this rendering over here, which is a performance space. Amazing in Dorchester that we're looking at spaces like this, that our kids deserve this. Um, so BC High right now, which is directly across the street, is, has launched a campaign for new fields and things like that. They're gonna spend 20, 30, 40 million, whatever it is over there. BC High has that. They have that, they have that sort of alumni base where they can, where they can reach back and, 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 and get the money to build what they need. Well, these kids that are in the Devon McCormick and these kids that are in Columbia Point and these kids that are all around, they're our responsibility, they're our alumni. So this is my request, our request, and I'm asking the City Council, and I appreciate you guys for coming out here today. This is our request to try and get some money from these APA dollars. Now, in Kenzie, I think we'll go through the money later on. I believe we have something like $350 million left. $10 million is a heavy, heavy ask. It's a big ask. I've never asked for $10 million before, and I'm sure none of you guys up there have ever asked for $10 million before, but you deserve $10 million. Um, $10 million translates into something around 2.8 or 3% of what we have left. 3% of what we have left. This building will be here in 50 years. When I'm dust, I'm in the ground dust, this building will be here still training people, still teaching people how to become citizens, how to, how to just care for one another. When we haven't, we spent two years not caring for each other, not being able to gather, not being able to support each other. This will be Boys and Girls Club on Deer Street on steroids. What the Boys and Girls Club does on Deer Street, which is up on Dodd Ave, it's in a building that is quite frankly falling apart. Um, and, and I feel the 10 million will be a, an amazing investment, an amazing feather in our caps that we were part of this, part of being able to drive $10 million towards this. And if we are able to get the $10 million here, I think in the next couple of years, two years, two and a half years, maybe three years, this thing will be built. Now, about six years ago, I asked for a um, feasibility study to, to build a community center, teen center in Dorchester someplace. We're still just looking for a site. Still just looking for a site. We have a site here now. We have money that's already been raised privately. We're going after state dollars. We're going after city dollars here today, and I think if we're able to show the commitment from the city of Boston that we care about these kids, we care about the kids that are in the Devon McCormick, we care about the kids that are in the Columbia Point development, we care about the kids that are around, we care about all the generations that are around, I think it's a special, special project, and I'm, 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 I'm willing to do what I need to to get this thing built here, and, 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 the, and one of the initial um, things that I'm doing is this is this hearing here today, and I appreciate I really appreciate my co my my colleagues coming out here, and and uh, Kenzie, I appreciate you doing this for me. I know it's a little different, but I, I I wanted you guys to see these kids up here, young people. We don't call you kids anymore. We call you call you young people, young adults. <laughs> I wanted you to 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 see these guys and gals come down here, and talk about what this field house means to them. And if, and if we are thoughtful with our money, because I know, I know Bob, I know we're gonna raise the rest of the money, but we need some help here right now. And when these guys come down and tell you how important this is for them and how involved they felt in this process, you're gonna know and you're gonna feel 
you're going to feel how special this 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 project is. Now, it, just one other side note that I want to that I want to mention. My illustrious career started in 1974 at the Deva at the Deva School. I was bust over there from my yeah. I was bust. I could probably six baseball throws. I was bust over there, and the the open space in the Deva is woeful, and it's looked that way since. I first laid eyes on it in 1974. There's been nothing at all done to it. Queenie, who's not here tonight, said the only thing that she ever saw, now she grew up right in, in Columbia Point housing projects, the only thing she ever saw happen in those basketball fields was a volunteer effort where they painted them. Go over and look at them now. That's all that's happened. There's, there's, there's no real fields over there. There's nothing that, that, that we can be proud of that's attached to a city of Boston, a public school. This can be, and I believe will be, um, attached to, to the Devon McCormick campus, which will be and can be attached to UMass, which will be and can be attached to the, the beat that's coming up, that's gonna, the beat that's happening, the beat is, is, is more job training. They're, go they're gonna have 30,000 square feet of, they don't know it yet, but they are gonna have 30,000 square feet of job training over there. Um, and I've been thinking about how it all works together. From the peninsula, for, for me, means from the beat, the old Boston Globe site, all the way out to UMass. How does every institution out on that peninsula connect how do we all connect? How do we, as the adults in the room, make sure that we give something to the younger people in the room? And I think this here, more than anything that I've ever seen, more than anything that I've ever seen, will help to heal my community. Um, and I, I hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you, Kenzie, and, and, and thank you guys for being here. And I appreciate you guys so much. You don't know how much you touched me the night that we all went through our elevator pitch. And I hope you have your elevator pitch ready, ready to go tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Baker. And definitely the sponsor gets the indulgence. I will encourage other colleagues <laughs> to be briefer. Um, uh, starting with Councillor Flaherty. And I'll just note we've also been joined by Councillor uh, Brian Morell of District 4 and Councillor Lydia Edwards of District 1. Um, Councillor Flaherty. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you to the lead sponsor. Great to see uh, him feeling better and fighting uh, for his district. So, uh, and much continued uh, progress, uh, Councillor Baker. Uh, as many know, uh, the BPDA recently unanimously approved the Dorchester Fieldhouse project uh, that will be a partnership between the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and the Martin Richard Foundation. Both organizations uh, have a superb track record already serving thousands of children and families in the Dorchester community. Both organizations provide exceptional youth programming and enrichment activities. And I think this location is a gem. You know, Councilor Baker just alluded to that, but if you think about its proximity to the McCormick Middle School, the Deva Elementary School, uh, my alma mater and soon to be John Forey's alma mater, BC High, and the partnerships that will exist with that great institution, along with UMass Boston, uh, and uh, I knew it as Columbia Point, as Frank Baker had mentioned. Uh, some know it as Harbor Point Development, Housing Development, and also the Geiger Gibson uh, Community Health Center. Uh, will be completely uh, transformative in that neighborhood with the additional investments that are taking place uh, out of the Bayside Expo site in Mount Vernon, along with the JFK station. So that said, uh, unfortunately, I have two other uh, scheduling commitments that I'm not going to be able to stay, but I commit to uh, watching the hearing and the testimony from our youth in its entirety, and just know that I am fully supportive of utilizing ARPA funds to get this project uh, off the ground, since I know the programs uh, here will deliver uh, as promised, like they have uh, at their other locations. And the goals and the objectives of the ARPA funds are just that, that's uh, real money, uh, that's meant to make a difference in the lives of people. This is generational uh, and general genera generational transformation for folks living out and going to school and working out in that area. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair, and look forward to uh, working together to try to make this a reality for the people that have committed to this. It's a great organization and gonna benefit so many people. Thank you, Thank you Madam.
Great, thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you to the chair and thank you to Councillor Baker for doing a nice introduction. Um, I can't think of a better way to spend this money, investing in our youth matters. And when I look at these pictures here of what it's going to look like, I think as a mom, I have to drive my kids to Canton or outside of the city to get them to participate in these activities. The city in our neighborhood, I'm at-large city councilor, but I live, you know, born and raised in Dorchester. We deserve this, our children deserve this. And I can't wait to hear from our youth to speak. And I know that your grandchildren, right, will be able to be here. You'll be there bringing your grandchildren to this location. So I'm looking forward to the testimony and 100% in support. We're coming out of, you know, this pandemic and we really need to wrap our kids and our neighborhoods around facilities like this that care about the mental health and the physical health and the holistic approach for our kids. So looking forward to tonight and thank you all for coming. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Councilor louis Jen. Thank you so much, um, Chair, for holding this hearing. Thank you to the sponsor for your passion and your advocacy. Um, thank you to everyone who is here, especially our young folks. Um, I too am, I don't know if any of you all are, any of you McCormick students? All right, I am a McCormick grad myself, went to my middle school. So I care deeply about what's happening there. When I was at McCormick, I ran track and that's where I was introduced to basketball. And so made out use of the outdoor facilities. I remember running track, we had to uh, use a track field at BC High. Um, so I definitely know that we need resources at the McCormick, at the Dever, where a lot of my uh, friends are teachers. Um, and I want us to also be thinking very critically always about how we're using public land and how we're using public resources to do, it's a shame and it's a travesty that Columbia Point, that we haven't done the development at the McCormick and the Dever. We needed facilities there a long time ago and we have the ability as a city with, with a strong economy, with good investments, to do that public infrastructure work to improve the quality of our schools, to make sure that we always have buildings and basketball courts and track fields that affirm your dignity and that really affirm your worth. So I'm here, really excited to hear from all of you and to learn more about this project and to see how we can support as a city and making sure that we're using our resources and our time judiciously. So thank you to everyone involved in this project and looking forward to learning more. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, President Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for coordinating this important discussion and thank you to the panelists and the young people that are here with us as well. I, I want to, I couldn't echo what Councillor Baker stated because he, he did it so eloquently and with, with, with compassion, but that's, that's exactly what a district city council or a city councilor does is at, represent their constituents the best they, they can and that's exactly what Councillor Baker is doing. Um, on this, on this proposal, I, I also support it 100%. I think the, 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 the funding from the federal government to the city to support this Boys and Girls um, Club would be a tremendous asset to residents of, of, of Dorchester. And most of them are kids, or kids of, of color or um, kids in public housing developments, kids really that never had an opportunity in life and Here's, here's a unique partnership of bringing, of bringing people together. And so I wanna, wanna thank my colleague, Councilor Baker for, for the important work he's doing and this $10 million will be a tremendous, tremendous asset. Over the weekend, they had a, a fundraiser um, to support this Boys and Girls um, Club program um, at Florian Hall and they were selling, they were selling books and it was a picture book by Bill, Bill Brett, and they're selling the books for, I don't know, $20 or so. But they had 500 people at Florian Hall donating any money they could because they wanted to see this project get off the ground. That's the type of spirit and cooperation, you know, residents of Dorchester have for this project. I, and Bill and Denise Richard were there, and it was great, it was great seeing them. Um, 
but I think, I think Council Baker sums it up best. Do, do, do these kids that are sitting in the audience deserve to have a state-of-the-art boys and girls club like, like you would see in, in Newton or Wellesley or Lincoln or, or Concord? And I think, I think the answer is, is, is yes. They, they deserve the same opportunity to play in a nice sports facility like that. Um, the other thing I, I especially like about Bill and Denise and their commitment um, to the youth through sports, but, I, but they have an incredible commitment to kids with disabilities. Um, you know, the park in, in South Boston, the Children's Museum, um, Martin Park, probably the nicest park in the country, and it's the most accessible park for kids with disabilities probably in the country too. And they also have this track meet at Moakley Park, and there's a lot of young young kids with disabilities competing in sports, and that's what that's what this family's about is bringing people together. And you know, you might have disabilities, you might not have any money or influence, or be from public housing development, but you you deserve an equal chance, you deserve an equal shot as, as any wealthy kid growing up in um, one of these elite towns. So. Just want to say thank you to my colleague, Council Baker, for the tremendous work he's doing on this important project. Um, thank you, Council Baker, and thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, Council Royal. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Council Baker for bringing this to our attention. And it's always good to see your colleague so passionate and excited about an idea. Um, and he, he brought, brought me into a community meeting, so I had the opportunity uh, to visit the Boys and Girls Club and saw firsthand the incredible work you know, the staff is doing with our young people um, and the amount of engagement that our students had in this development process should definitely be replicated throughout our city. Um, and just seeing that happen in the development process and it play out in the design, I'm 100% sure that this place will be, that this new center will be welcoming and inclusive. So I'm looking forward to the presentation. I'm looking forward to those elevator pitches that Frank helped you guys on, uh, and I'm, well, I'm looking to be supportive any which way I can. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Well. Um, Councillor Edwards? Well, thank you so much, and thank you for being here tonight. You know, this is, uh, Frank had reached out to each of us uh, to make, or Councillor Baker, excuse me, uh, to make sure that we were all here specifically to hear from you. But I think it's also really exciting for me, at least, and for a lot of folks, for you to hear Councillor Baker fight for you. Um, there are a lot of times, I'm sure you've heard of Councillor Baker and <laughs> some of the comments and his passion on this floor, but I'm telling you to see him fight for his district is by far one of the best things about working with you, Councillor Baker. So this isn't just a you to us, which I'm very excited to hear some of your, um, some of your advocacy and to hear your pitch. Um, you don't have to sell me, though. When Frank says he is passionate about something, I, I support Frank. But it's really important that all of us see Frank fight for his kids, not just his two little ones at home. Uh, you are his kids. So it's wonderful to see that today. And I just want to apologize in advance. Um, I'm pulling double duty tonight, so I will be in and out. Um, on, uh, on a Zoom where there's another group of kids are advocating uh, in Winthrop actually tonight. So I will be going between the two. But you have my support and I look forward to watching the video if I miss any of you. So thank you so much for coming and thank you for your heart, Councillor Baker. Thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. And um, for those of you in the audience, Councillor Edwards is also a state senator these days. So she's uh, hol holding up half the world here. Um, uh, I want to read a letter from our colleague, Councillor Julia Mejia, a city councillor at large. Um, dear Madam Chair, members of the Committee on Boston's COVID-19 reco Recovery, I am writing to inform you of my absence from today's hearing on docket 0265, an order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant fund through the coronavi coronavirus state and local fiscal fund. Due to an unforeseen scheduling conflict, I am not able to attend. However, I would like to go on record in support of the sponsor's proposal for the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester as the chair of the Committee on Education. A member of my staff will be listening in and we'll be sure to follow up with any questions or concerns. Sincerely, Julia Mejia, Boston City Councilor at Large. Um, so I wanna thank Councilor Mejia for sending that in. Um, and I'll just say uh, on, my, 
on my own behalf that um, I'm delighted to have you all here. Uh, it is, um, it's good to be together. It's good to have, as, as we mentioned, our young people in the chamber here to share um, their passion with us. And um, we, you know, we are going to be, I'll, I'll talk a little bit after the presentations because we want to get to you guys, but um, we are going to be having a process around the city's coronavirus funds in the coming months. Um, and obviously we're going to be talking about a lot of worthy and deserving things. Um, and so, you know, it's always difficult to kind of parse that through and make trade-offs and all of that. But I think that um, it's very important for me as the chair to make sure that there's a forum for counselors who see sort of critical needs in their district and critical opportunities to use these funds to bring those to this chamber, to the whole body, and, you know, through uh, the televising of these hearings to the city so that everybody can kind of weigh and understand all the things under consideration. So um, I'm excited about this tonight and looking forward to kind of doing some more of that in general as we all parse um, this out together. Um, so I want to just, um, let me just, I'm actually going to take a very brief recess because I just want to check in with a sponsor before we go to you all so that we don't, um, you may say I've already heard all their pitches. I'll go ahead and start. I'm running two minutes late, but I just want to, I just want to check with him. So I'm just going to hold a 60 second recess. So this is, this is the plan. Um, I'm going to go right now to a, a, a panel here that's in front of me. I've got um, Dot Joyce from Joyce Strategies, Bob Scannell, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dor Dorchester, and Kevin Diebler, the principal of Road Architects. I'm going to let them give their presentation. Um, then I think what we're going to do is I'm going um, to ask you guys to rotate into the side seats, and we'll have the Youth Advisory Board panel come down and join us in these same seats. So I've, just so you're ready when the time comes, I've got Jessica Martin, John Forey, Hadito Ba, and uh, Fatimata Balde. And you can correct me on the pronunciation when you're down here. Um, so, and so what we'll do is we'll hear from the panel, we'll hear from the Youth Advisory Board, and then we'll go to counselor questions all at once, because I think that probably makes more sense than, um, than having us wait on the youth folks. So, um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to the panel. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and all of the counselors for being here today, and our sponsor, Councillor Baker. Um, thank you and allow, for allowing us this opportunity. Um, my name is Dot Joyce. I'm joined with Bob Scannell from the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and Kevin Diebler from Rody Architects. Um, the Dorchester Fieldhouse, or we can rename it today the Boston Fieldhouse. Um, it's a building of more than just um, competitive indoor athletic spaces. As some of you have already mentioned, it's a full youth development complex focused on serving the adjacent BPS K-12 students, as well as the 50,000 children within three miles of the facility. We know, and I don't know if there's a slide deck running or not. They have it here. Um, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. They have it in front of them. Yeah, oh, so you do. We, uh, Carrie, could you, um, we can ask um, if, uh, Carrie, you could, do you have a slide deck to put up? Maybe Ron, can you check? I don't know if the people on screen can see it or not. Oh. Maybe they can. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there we go. The slide deck is here. So if you just say next slide and then. I, I oh, you've got it. Yeah. You've got it. Okay, great. That's I'm Brenna. <laughs> Brenna Galvin. <laughs> great. Excellent. Next yep. slide, Bren. We know our city is progressing forward with rising population and record-setting development across all neighborhoods. Boston is certainly on the move, thanks to all of you. But we can't lose sight of the fact that as this growth is happening, we are losing kids and becoming a wealthier city with fewer families. But we can change this trajectory. Next slide. The city is doing its part by supporting affordable housing and making equity and participation a priority. We hope in partnership with you, we can do our part as well. Advancing this project, a comprehensive indoor athletic and youth development complex for our young people, an amenity that doesn't currently exist for Boston's youth. Too often our kids are forced outside in winter months trying to navigate the challenges of wet or snow-filled fields to practice or play. Very dis difficult in mo for most of our youth and impossible for those with differing dis abilities. As COVID took hold, it became even more clear that we need new facilities for youth and families 
and capacity within our nonprofit organizations to support all people in all of our neighborhoods. I'm going to turn it over to Bob Scannell. Um, he's going to run through a little bit about um, who we serve, how we build that capacity for those disproportionately affected by COVID, and scaling pro programs um, that build more equitable opportunities for everyone. Bob. Yeah. Thank you, Dot. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Council Baker, for bringing this forward. We're so grateful. And I, I can speak for myself and Bill and Denise that listening to yourself and your passion for this and the other counselors, uh, their interest in this project, it means a lot to us. We've been working very hard here uh, to really uh, create some equity. More than one council mentioned, you go to the suburbs, that's where you see the facilities that are so nice. This is a one-of-a-kind facility here in the city to serve city kids. Um, I know myself, lugging my kids around the South Shore mostly and the North Shore when they were younger, uh, there was nothing in Boston like this uh, for children. And I think if you look at the renderings, we're talking about an athletic facility and so much more. Uh, it really is uh, addressing all the needs of all children. When you look at the arts, there'll be a music clubhouse, a theater, teaching kitchen, cafe. Um, we're very committed also to creating a, a very substantive wellness program for the children because these days, the top priority at our Boys and Girls Club and with the Martin Richard Foundation is really addressing the issues of our social and emotional well-being, and that is tops on our list. So as much as we see these very important athletic facilities, and they're beautiful, um, the entire facility will serve the whole child. And when you think about it, I think if, if you can read the slide up there, um, it, it's kind of hard to read, but it's basically a snapshot of uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester now and, and the children we serve and the demographics. Um, and the demographics should come as no surprise to anyone, I would suggest. Um, but what jumps out is, at me, though, is, you know, 85% of, of the 4,000 children who go to our three clubs are, are, are low-income families. 65% of our members uh, go to Boston Public Schools. Now, obviously, with this facility, that number is going to jump up. That percentage is going to skyrocket because we are steps away from McCormick Endeavor schools, and, and I'm told there will be 1,000 children uh, at those schools. So this is really important. Uh, those children are a very significant priority for this project. And uh, while we're in the process of working out the details with the schools, it's been very exciting to work with those schools to come up with the best plan of how we provide the most opportunities for those students and their families during the school day and after school hours. So that's uh, very important to us. And I'd love people to visit our clubs. A lot, a lot of folks have been there, but visit our clubs and come see for yourself. We love showing people around. Um, uh, next slide. Okay, so I, I wanted to put this in, in front of everyone because when COVID hit, uh, we determined that we, we, couldn't, we couldn't close. So as soon as we were able uh, to open up our facilities, we did. Uh, early childhood programs opened up uh, the first week of that July, and that was critical. We have infant, toddler, and preschool children who attend, uh, hundreds of them at our three sites. So that was really important, helping families get back to work uh, and, and have the kids in a stable setting. Uh, and furthermore, we had 150 students in what we call learning hubs. Uh, I think, again, we're talking about this issue of equity. We're in the suburbs. We saw families putting together their own type of learning hubs, which they could pay all kinds of money for to have teachers come in or, or others to work with the children and care for them during the day. Well, that's the role we played when we opened our clubs when the pandemic hit. So we had our staff uh, working with uh, the students at our three clubs, and it was a challenge. <laughs> our kids go to 100 and 140 different schools, so you can imagine some of the, the challenges with that. But uh, the children were at our sites. Um, they were taken care of. They were uh, tuning into their classrooms by Zoom. And in addition to that, which was really a nice plus, is that we could offer enrichment programs uh, throughout the day and after the school hours for those children. So. We felt like we really filled a critical need. And then um, when you look at the numbers, we did 4,000 family wellness checks. That's our staff checking in with families, ask them what they need, how are they feeling, uh, what's their anxiety level, what can we do to support. 
Uh, and that was uh, really amazing work by our staff. You can see the, the, you know, the number of uh, meals. We've given out diapers and formula and um, academics. The program hours were 3,100 plus hours of academics for the children and our staff were trained in the proper curriculum. So we're very proud of that and we were able to engage our families and it's, it's meant so much to them. So, uh, so we, we, we weathered that storm. We helped uh, particularly the most high risk families because we couldn't have our full membership back given the, um, the restrictions. Um, but that was really important and we're proud that we were able to do that. Um, uh, this slide says we can do more. I think we can always do more and that's always our ambition at, at Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. Um, I, I do like to talk about the partnerships we have already with the Boston Public Schools. Um, the, the Russell School, to me, it's one of my favorite where the students, uh, uh, through funding from an outside source, come to our clubs uh, two mornings a week for three hours for enrichment programs. It, it, it's meditation. It's uh, arts and music, it's swimming. And I, I, I love it because it really makes their school week a lot better. They look forward to going to school because they can come to the Boys and Girls Club with their teachers and with our staff taking good care of them. So uh, that is a, a program that I would love to see replicated, to be honest. And about 10 years ago, we piloted uh, with the city uh, a K-1 program for four-year-olds, which has been uh, absolute uh, model of success. Uh, nearly 500 students ha have gone through that program. And so that's a really, uh, we're really proud of that relationship with BPS to provide uh, those young children, those, those services and their, and their families. And, uh, and the challenge of sports, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, Council President uh, Flynn mentioned uh, the great work of, of the Martin Richard Foundation and Bill and Denise. Well, it was a number of years ago that uh, that we instituted the Martin Richard Challenger Sports Program um, for the members, for the students. And what a success that has been. It's the children who have emotional or, or physical disabilities coming to play sports. And it's, it's baseball one season, then it's basketball, then it's swimming, and then it's, what am I missing? Soccer. Soccer. <laughs> uh, soccer. Um, and it was kind of funny because we did soccer first of all and all the parents at the end of it said, well, what now, what next when that ended? And it struck us like, oh, okay, we, we, we can do more, let's do more. So we did. And, uh, and so we've got a really robust program. Um, I think it's about 125 to 150 children in that program. So it, it's really pretty awesome. And, and it just aligns, you know, our missions align so nicely because inclusion is very important to us. And, um, you know, the idea of no child being left out means everything to us, and, and, and that may mean a, a disability uh, or something else, the cost. We charge $5 a year for children to be members of, of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester, so, so we, we, we get the gray hairs from raising all the money to, to get things paid for, um, but that's important to us, and most kids don't, don't actually pay, and, and, and that's okay, too. Um, but the idea that the students at the BCLA McCormick Endeavor will become members of the club at no cost and be able to take advantage of all the opportunities we have, uh, that's really significant to us. You know, it's, it's the healthy lifestyles and fitness, right? it's the arts and music, uh, the emotional and social well-being programs that we run, family engagement, workforce development, very important to us, and the educational opportunities uh, are really outstanding, whether it's homework help every day, um, SAT prep, college tours, um, you name it. So there, there are all kinds of opportunities for the children uh, at our clubs. And what, what this new facility allows us to is expand the scope of our programming um, to include more children. And I think at the end of the day, that's the goal. I don't have to tell anyone in this room uh, these types of facilities and programs are needed now more than ever. I think people realize that. We've always known that. Um, but I think more than ever, we need these types of facilities for children. Uh, next slide. I think that's me. Well, that's not me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> hand it uh, uh, back to Dot Joyce, but uh, uh, thank you all for, uh, for hearing us today and being here, and, and for those who voice support, we thank you so much for that. Dot? 
Um, just moving through these next couple slides, I know the most important is actually after us. So location matters, um, but it's really important when you're talking about programs like Bob mentioned in the services for kids and families. This slide represents the many youth serving partners we have in a small geographic area. I know Councillor Baker mentioned this earlier. We have the opportunity at this site to knit all of the knowledge, support, and experience of these entities together through one anchor facility that they all have the ability to share. This is an intentional site where just building a field house would have been a disservice to the city. The location allows us an opportunity to support BPS students in a more meaningful way, connect more deeply with our neighbors at Harbor Point, complement the exis existing Walter Denny Center across the street, easy access to public transportation for youth across our city, and is within walking distance to UMass Boston and the Geiger Gibson Health Center. This location and this facility can and will create a model of placemaking for young people and their families from birth through career with wraparound services all connected together in one youth destination on the peninsula. Next slide. In our very early work in designing and thinking about this site, we met with several stakeholder groups. From the Boston Public Schools next door to our neighbors at Harbor Point, parents with children of differing abilities, and most importantly, the youth of our city. We established a youth advisory board who not only had a chance to learn about the building and development process from the city perspective in ours, but also provided much needed feedback as we moved through our initial designs. There are 16 members of this group and they conducted their own survey of their peers to gather information and inform their comments to the development team. Many of them are here today behind us here and you'll hear from them shortly. We also sought the input of community advisory, advisory board to give us some perspectives and diversity of thought as we move forward in our plans. Next slide. What we heard and why we're here. The feedback from those initial stakeholder groups led us to three guiding principles. People had expressed through various ways the need for this space to be accessible, flexible, and intentional. More importantly, the feedback we heard allowed us a new approach to the building, a complete redesign and collaborative approach to the project. We shifted the building to maximize the outdoor space and created the only front yard space on Mount Vernon Street increased collaboration with the adjacent schools and built into the model more space and opportunity for enrichment programming. We thought more about how to actively promote this facility for the entire community with a public cafe, teaching kitchen, and theater performance space. With these improvements and these guiding principles in mind, our project can be a model for that placemaking for youth. Weaving together spaces and partnerships that drive healthy outcomes for youth and families, it truly could be transformational. But these investments come at a premium. And have, contributed to a, and, and have contributed to a funding gap for this project of $20 million. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Diebler from Rody Architects who can run through a little bit more about how we got here and uh, seeking your help. Sure, thank you, Dot, and uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Baker, um, and all the other councillors in attendance appreciate um, um, this audience today. I'm Kevin Diebler uh, with Rody Architects, um, but I'm also a BPS parent and a Dorchester resident. Um, bringing some perspective to this uh, project. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, where we are today with the current design is understood as a, as a process of intentional listening. Um, Dot mentioned a, a funding gap um, and how did we get here to that point. Um, where, what we started with as an idea has evolved in this process, the youth input and feedback throughout this very public process with uh, both BPS and the Article 80 process has shaped this building, this place, and this idea. Um, what you'll see in the two kind of site plans here is that the first proposal was really kind of a, a, a simple concrete idea of a turf field, which is in a large shed building. Um, it has evolved into something that has a much more compact footprint uh, to preserve as much open space as possible. Um, and I think it's just important to really just kind of list through uh, a lot of the features uh, that are in this building uh, that came apart, came out of this process that we went through, which is a large front uh, public lawn, uh, a relationship to the Harbor Point Greenway, which will uh, implement parts of the Columbia Point Master Plan, um, multiple other outdoor spaces of different scale and sizes, a covered public plaza, uh, two full basketball courts indoors, um, with a walking track that wraps around it so that parents can sort of watch while uh, kids are playing games. Um, an indoor turf field up on floor three, um, as well as a theater, a public cafe, a teaching kitchen, 
uh, fully inclusive design features, elevators, access, uh, universally accessible on every square foot of this uh, space. As well, the Martin Richard Foundation offices would be located here, which would be mostly used as an incubator for other nonprofits. Um, so this, um, uh, next slide please, uh, this very deliberate um, and patient process that we went through of, of listening um, probably has come at a, at a cost in some manner to the today's economy. Uh, one of Boston's great strengths is its building and what we're building today for institutions, labs, housing, um, means that we are, um, according to the engineering news record, the place with the highest cost of uh, materials and labor. Um, it is uh, costing us in terms of uh, escalation per month um, and has added uh, $3 million uh, per year. Um, so we, we may mean to sort of uh, create at least some notion of, of urgency with why we're um, coming to this point and trying to close this gap. Um, but I appreciate your time, and, and uh, we'll get on to the, the best uh, part of this presentation soon. And that's uh, our final slide um, from the unique location, the next generation programming and forward-looking design. The big idea is a new state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind facility and a significant investment in our, our youth and their families because the unprecedented development in our city must also include new development for youth. Um, we hope you agree, we know you agree in all of the things that you do on a daily basis um, and uh, hope you support this funding request uh, in front of you today with $10 million and help us really close this gap. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much to the panel. Um, and if I can ask you, if you guys don't mind grabbing these three seats here, the one that's back there and the two up there, just so that we keep you close to the mics. Um, and then I'll invite the... Youth Advisory Board panel to come down. Do you want them all to come? Okay. Yeah, they're gonna go into these. The four, the four. And we, I know we've got some other members of the board that's that are gonna speak to us in a bit as well. So, but we're starting with these four. Um, and thank you guys, welcome. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do, you guys can tell me who's going first, but I just ask you to um, introduce yourself to the counselors um, before, so just say your name before you start um, with your statement. And uh, before I go to you, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we've been, we were joined a while back actually by uh, Counselor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, so thank you. Uh, Counselor Fernandez Anderson, do you wanna say anything? Just, we did opening statements if you wanted to. Ron, Carrie, are we gonna get? <laughs> just, hey, it's me, <laughs> right? Thank you. Um, welcome, greetings to all you courageous beings. You guys are amazing, you're so beautiful. Thank you for coming. I'm here to listen. Yes, you deserve this and better. And um, I just want to hear different details. I'm gonna ask some hard questions, but that only says that I want I want you to have the best. All right. Thanks for being here. Um, all right. So now we go to you guys. So who's going first? Jessica. Okay. Great. Introduce yourself. Oh. So participating in the youth advisory group gave me the chance to share my and other community members' vision for the new field house. I had the opportunity to interview family and friends to get their feedback on what they might want to see in the field house and to share this information with the architects. I enjoyed meeting and interacting with the other members of the council, many that I had not met before, hearing their ideas and getting to share my own thoughts about what I li would like to see in the field house especially as it relates to inclusion. It was exciting to be able to work with the architects on the design process that includes soft surfaces for wheelchairs, ramps, for easy access to the building and surrounding areas, 
and even a sensory room for those that might need a break and some quiet time and to see all our ideas come together. The new field house is being designed to be inclusive and welcoming to all. Inclusion is a mission of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and the Martin Richard Foundation and was a focus throughout the planning process. In addition to having all the needed accommodations like elevators and soft surfaces for wheelchairs and ramps for easy access to the building and surrounding areas. It will provide a safe place for children of differing abilities to participate in a wide range of extracurricular activities, including the Martin Richard Challenger sports program. The ability to host these sports programs, especially for those with physical disabilities indoors, is a game changer for this program. No more cancellations of game due to inclement weather, which as you can imagine, can be very challenging for someone in a wheelchair and very disappointing for a child who is looking forward to the, that weekly game with their friends. Children with physical and intellectual disabilities want to do the same things that other children do. And, that, and this field house will be a place where they can do just that. A place to learn a new skill, a sport, and be part of a team, and more importantly, make new friends. Taking part in activities at the field house will offer the opportunity for children and adults of all ages to have fun, maybe step outside their comfort zone and explore new activity they may not have tried before and meet new people from the community that share similar interests. It will allow each of us to show our talents and what we can do, but also will sh allow us to have a safe place where we can just be ourselves and have fun. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And that's, is that Jessica? Jessica. Jessica Martin? Martin, yes. Wonderful, great. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that testimony. Next up. Did I just press this? Oh, it works. Yeah. Um, I wanna start off by thanking Council Baker for like, just allowing us to be here. It honestly means so much, and I f honestly feel everything that you were saying. Thank you. My name is Hariatu. I go by Hari. Um, my experience on being on the Youth Advisory Board was honestly like thrilling. Like when I first found out about the Youth Advisory, the Youth Advisory Board. Ooh, sorry, I wanted to be a part of it because, as a student that went to McCormick, like for since seventh grade, having the a basketball court. I agree to yeah. you. Uh, yeah. As an athlete, as an athlete, we didn't have that. And living in Hubbard Point, knowing that we're building something right across the street that's accessible to everyone, not just us, everyone in the community is honestly, is honestly amazing. And the Fieldhouse is important to my community because it's in a true investment that will, that will be generations. I could look back on this couple years, my little sister, my cousins, not only not only us, but the elders, like, we'll all be able to be accessible to this. As an athlete, these facilities are important to me because this, this facility brings out all communities, not just in Dorchester and Boston, Fields Corner. And we know the club allows to expose different passions and sports. So just knowing that these resources is here will be very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Hattie. And next up. Um, my name is Fatu Mata. I go by Fatu. Um, the field house is important for me and my community because we we'll all have like access to everything. Like whether you want to do sports or you want to do arts or you want to do theater, just anything. Or you want to learn how to cook even. We could go there and learn how to cook. Um, when I attended the McCormick School, there was a lot that needed to be done there even though I've only been alive for like 13 years, but that doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, like having a facility there where kids could just go there after school being like, hey, you wanna go for a basketball game? Let's go play. And it's like being a city kid, like we don't have access to a lot of stuff like that. Like a lot of the times our stuff are run down and like broken, but like having the facility there, it'll be like, I get to feel kind of rich, you know? <laughs> and I'll be like, 
able to do anything that I want. And my vision for the field house would be anybody could go there, no matter your ability, whatever you believe in, like you could go there and you have access to every single thing. Like I could go there with my mom, with my nephew, like we could all have so much fun there. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much Fatu. Uh, next up. Uh, hi, my name's John Forey. I'm a senior at BC High. And um, I just wanna say thank you all for having us here, giving us the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm also lucky enough to be a member of the YAB. And um, through that group, we met pretty much twice a week. And we got the honestly amazing opportunity to talk to the designers and the architects about what we wanted to see with the building. And um, when I was first reached out to uh, participate in this, I honestly didn't have uh, many high hopes. I thought it was sort of just gonna be, oh yeah, we'll get the students input, but not really. But um, uh, it's honestly been awe-inspiring to see the changes that, that have been made because of us and because of the work that we've done. Um, some, some specific examples I can think of are like the kitchen. Uh, I didn't mention that, but some of my peers did. And to see that become a reality lets me know that like, the people behind this really do care, and obviously you all care too, or else we wouldn't be here right now. Um, and I think one, one part of it, especially with me going to BC High, that I realize is this is gonna act as a really good center point for the community, not just for Dorchester, but for areas all around it. Um, going to BC High, I'm one of the few Dorchester kids there actually. There's a lot more kids from the South Shore and other places, and I feel like this could act as sort of a mechanism for people from all over the place to come and connect and sort of get that same experience that I feel like I received when I, I've been going to the Boys and Girls Club my entire life, so being over there on Deer Street, I really feel like I was able to experience a lot of different cultures, and I really hope that this field house can bring that to the uh, Harbor Point area. Great, thank you so much, John. Thank you to all of our panelists. And I know that we've got, like I said, we've got some more YAB members who are signed up in public testimony. Um, but I wanna take a moment now for council questions. So actually, Dot, why don't you? Um, great, and uh, yeah, and so we'll do questions at the same time for both our, our youth um, advisory board members and our first panel, um, and I'll uh, go to the lead sponsor first. Thank you. Um, can can you guys talk about a little bit the, uh, first of all, thank you guys for coming out, everybody, and thank you guys especially. Um, it, it means a lot, it means a lot. And I wanna know what you wanna do when you grow up. You told me in the last time, I don't know if you still remember, I'll ask you that in questioning. Um, can you talk a little bit, Bob, about um, <clears throat> the relationship with administration in the Dever and the McCormick? What, what do the talks look like there? What is that relationship gonna look, going to look like? What's in your head and what's, what's been put on paper? Councilor, um, it, it's what's in my head, but it's what's in the head of the administrators of the schools too. So the right. nice thing is, uh, it's an exciting process because we can sit down together and talk about what we envision together. What could the opportunities be for the students? Uh, the opportunities are really significant. And so we are going through, what, it's more of a formal process to put, put together an MOU to spell out what that all looks like. Um, but you know, between the BCLA, McCormick leadership, and the DEVA leadership, we know they're very excited about what, what we're gonna put in this facility. Uh, when it all comes together, and how that's best used is what we're gonna iron out now. But I, I will say this, so Boys and Girls Clubs are primarily after school programs, other than our early education programs. So during the school day, you know, the students there, the thousand or so students, will have significant access to the facility. And I just think that's the most amazing thing right now. I think you heard from, from some in the room, some of the, some of the uh, youth uh, advisory board members, um, some of the facilities aren't, aren't the best. You know, I would suggest that this field house could make those schools destination schools because of, because of what you see here on these renderings, which will come to life. Um, so again, during the school day, the students can be in and out of there, and it, and it may be in the teaching kitchen, which I happen to love too. I think that's gonna be used around the clock. Um, for, for children during the day and families and parents. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, the athletic facilities for phys ed classes and other things, um, are, it, that's huge. 
Um, we've, we, you know, you look at the theater, but we're gonna put in a music clubhouse. And, and I know uh, BCLA McCormick School is very, very excited about that. We, we have one at our other, one of our other facilities. We've had it for about 15, 20 years, and it's a home run. Uh, a lot of kids don't get the opportunity to learn music or play music. Uh, so that will happen in there. So I think you know, the opportunities are, are really endless. And the fact that all these children become members of our Boys and Girls Club network, uh, it opens a lot more doors. Yep, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, thank you for that, for that, Bob. Can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> what the financing looks like now? Like what, wh if you're able to, if you're comfortable with, um, what have, and I always say we, and I'm not part of it, but what have we raised so far? <laughs> We've raised, uh, well, um, so we've raised, uh, we came out of the gate really quick. We raised $7 million um, in, in various numbers. They were million dollar donors, they were $25 donors. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's been exciting, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, what we're spending a lot of our time on, and we have a really good fundraising team on staff and on our board and, and consultants that we brought in, uh, we've been meeting with a lot of the foundations, uh, a lot of the big foundations, the Boston Foundation, Yaki, the list goes on. Um, and uh, the Boston Foundation is very, very excited about this project. You know, we're very grateful that, that, that Lee Pelton is, is supporting this, and, and he's awesome, and, and he's going to support this effort. So that means a lot to us. H have they kicked in yet? Or their, their, su their, their support? Have they kicked in yet? Uh, I'll say two things. They support the Boys and Girls Club annually, which yeah. is uh, awesome, and they recently made a commitment to the project. Okay. And uh, we, we know we can count on them. So, so that's what we're doing now. We're going through a process of meeting with foundation, individual donors, some corporations. Um, the, the council president mentioned the uh, event we had the other day, and there'll be other events. Um, Dot talked a little bit about, about the gap because of the escalation in the costs, and that's, um, that, that's reality. We got to raise more money than we thought we needed to, uh, and that that that's why this is important. You know, if we can be successful here today, you know, and, and going through this process and access the, the ten million dollars in ARPA funds, we know that the state has some ARPA funds aside, and they will look at that in, in a very important light, and and we would expect to have some good success there. So what happens when you raise half the money? is that's when all the funders, they're knocking on your door. They want to get in. It's ne it's ne fundraising is the hardest part of anything we do, uh, no doubt about it, Counselor. Um, but I think we have a good plan. We have a lot of support and a lot of friends out there, so we feel very good about it. But I must stress that today, the funding we're talking about today, that $10 million, I, I view as very critical to moving forward. I really do. I think it's really important. And we can't pass up this opportunity for kids. Um, this is a once in a, this is a historic opportunity. I mean, the facility, this is 75,000 square feet, which is massive. We have three other boys and girls clubs we operate. Combined, they don't add up to 75,000 square feet. So that give you some perspective there. This is really important to us. And teaming up with, uh, with Bill Richard and the Martin Richard Foundation, um, we're reaching out to all of our networks to get this done. But we need, we need everyone to get on board. Uh, the kids deserve this. You know, this, why don't kids in the city have facilities like this? Can anyone ever answer that question? I ask it, I've asked it for years. Because um, we never had the money, Bob. We never had the money. The fields, we, we, we play, the fields that we played on when we were younger, I mean, I played in parking lots that were covered in glass, and yeah. you know, the little house was my home. Yeah. Was my home. You know, you you had to shoot a certain way, otherwise you'd hit the beams. You know, it wasn't a regulation court; it was all padded around. But <laughs> it was good times. Um, but we, Boston hasn't. We we just became successful in the last 15 years or so. You know, it, so there's money around now, and it's time to. To invest, sorry to cut you off there. No, and 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 that's great. And you know, it, it was several months ago when we started to see this ARPA funding coming down. And when everything I read about it, I'm like, my goodness, our project is the perfect candidate for this funding. It's a one-time investment of funds that'll serve the community for decades. And, and that's my understanding of ARPA funding. It's not to support a program that's going to need funding year after year from some source. 
Um, this is a one-time investment in a facility that will be around for the next 100 years. And so that's why we, we really wanted to get serious about this. And, and hopefully here, here in City Hall, we can have some success. It's that important to our success, this funding. So let me, let me break something down that you said um, in, in fundraising. And I don't fundraise like the way you do. I fundraise my campaign, and that's difficult enough. But so on, on, when you reach that level, you're saying the people with the money, they're all holding it and waiting for you to get halfway there, you know, 60% there, and then they all want to be, they want to be there for the photo op. Would uh, that be a correct assessment? Uh, it, it is. So, uh, particularly the foundations, right, the big ones, they, um, they look at those metrics and they want to be sure that we have a viable project. Now, I thought a great milestone was the Article 80 process and the unanimous approval of the BPDA board uh, to move this project forward. Okay, that, to me, that was a wonderful milestone, and that had meaning to our funders. It did. Now getting to at least the halfway mark of the funds we need, is, uh, it, it really does open doors to those funders. They're like, okay, this is real, and this is important. They know it's important already, but they want to make sure it's real and that we can get this project done. And so raising half the funds is uh, it, kind of like a magic number. You yeah. know, next thing you know, know, we're calling the funders and they're saying, yeah, come on, let's get serious about this. Let's talk about how much we can come up with to support it. And that, that's just traditional fundraising. That is really how it works, Councilor. And, and like, would we need to get to the $50 million before we can put a shovel in the ground? No, we can get in before that. So, you know, we've, we've had that discussion with uh, not, not only our great architects at Rody, but uh, Lee Kennedy Company, who's, who's the contractor. And who's we've- the Lee, Lee, Lee Kennedy's a contractor? Lee Kennedy Company. Uh, and so we feel comfortable going in the ground with uh, $35 million, 35, okay. 37, and that's based on, on some metrics that they use. Yeah, and, and yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and so based on that, Kevin, what would, a, what would a construction schedule look like? <clears throat> Shovel in the ground tomorrow, how long is it gonna take us to build? It'll come on. It'll, um, it'll take uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of uh, 18 months to build. Um, so there's a, uh, a, a chance this could be uh, built by 2023 um, at, the, at the sort of pace that we're, we're hoping to go. Uh, so the end of next year. Um, and uh, more than likely into the 2024, um, but that's the sort of uh, time frame there. Okay, um, and my last question for this side of the room is, uh, has, has, <clears throat> um, is, is Mark Wahlberg gonna be involved in this one? <laughs> uh, I'm quite certain he will be. Okay. It's hard to talk about individual funders. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but I mean, you, you bring the star power, you bring the, and, and I know he's a big, I, I know he's a big benefactor down there. Yeah, And right. his nephew has worked down there for years, so, you know, it'd be nice to, you know, even, even events that he'd, he'd be part of would be, would be helpful, I think, so. Yeah, and, and you'd be amazed, uh, Councilor, like, the people we reach out to, it, you know, sometimes it's celebrities. Yeah. In that case, uh, he attended the Boys and Girls Club, and it was a very, it's a very meaningful place to him, and he supports it in a big way every year. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we have a lot of, fun, some are, uh, you know, wealthy individuals who have connections to Dorchester. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't talk do about Do they have OFD funders, stickers but. on their cars? <laughs> well, they do. Well, I had one give me $2 million recently. I don't care if he has he a sticker on or not. He can do whatever. Yeah. He, he's Excellent. got the free pass in Dorchester. Um, but, uh, but there is so much, obviously, pride in this community that we all love. Um, we hope to be very successful with those who have come through our community yeah. and, and, and have done well. So honestly, the list of people we're reaching out to for support is, is pretty extensive. And it's an amazing building, so it, 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 you, you, when you think about legacy, when you think about generations, this is, this is something that people can, be, can, can hang their hat on. Well, they're very excited when they see our, uh, hear our presentation. And I'll tell you something that's really important. Um, as the price went up, as the cost went up, and as we increased the size and scope of, of the facility, you know, Bill and I had decisions to make. Do, do we cut back? Do we cut out? And we're like, no, mm. no, we need to raise more money, right? C call us crazy. You wouldn't be the first ones to call us crazy, but 
We don't want to create less of a facility or opportunity for kids and families. Come on. We want to build what we're proposing here with all the good work that these young folks did for us, okay, in the community and what we want to see. Why should we cut corners? We've got to find the money. We're not cutting corners. Like I'm telling you right now, we will not scale back until we find out that we're not getting the support that this deserves. But I want to be optimistic about that. You know, we talked about the gap that we have and, and the reasons for that. Um, we're just relying on everyone to step up and get in our corner. And again, I'm going to be optimistic about that. Thank you. Go big or go home. From left to right here, favorite part of the favorite part of the um, field house. Where are you um, going to spend your time, John? I'd say for me, it, I definitely have to check out the music room. Uh, just recently, I started playing guitar uh, last November, so I definitely know the power that can come from investing yourself in like a new instrument or a new activity. And um, I'm really looking forward to testing out that space. I'm sure it'll be beautiful. And I, I just feel like that speaks to all the opportunities that are available there and all the different avenues that I feel like young people and kids in general can get lost in almost. I bring this up every meeting and I will continuously bring it up. I love the stairs. Yes. The, the stairs. The stairs? Yeah. Yes. Like stairs. walk up the stairs, walk down the stairs? Yeah. But like the thing about the stairs. You're going to get your that, steps in today? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing about the stairs is that they're like, there's two separate parts of the stairs. It's like when someone's going up one side, you can sit on the other side. Yeah. That's genius. So conversations on the stairs and sitting around on the stairs yes. and just back and forth forming yes. relationships. Madame? Um, I would have to say there's so much. Yes. And we, we all put our into this. Like since COVID, it's honestly been a challenge, but knowing that's going to become true is honestly, oh, I can't wait. Okay, um, I would say the theater room, because we never, I never, we never had access to a theater room. So knowing that we could be on a stage, put on plays, and do whatever, <laughs> I'm there. Yeah, you're I'm in. There. You're in. Yeah. Madame? Um, I'd probably have to say that I probably will be spending my, most of my time, if I had to choose an area, probably having to do with like the, like, uh, the arts er portion of things as I'm like very creative and it would be good to share that, those skills with um, future generations. What so. is your art? You draw, you paint, what do you um, do? Photography and painting. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Baker. Um, and uh, I, do you just, before I go to Councillor Murphy, I just want to acknowledge, because I should have said it earlier, um, we do have the, um, the Mayor's Department of Intergovernmental Relations here tonight. We've got the Chief of Staff, Neil Doherty, and um, our City Council Liaison, Chantal Lima Barbosa. So I just want to, I want to thank them for being here. Um, it's important to us that the Mayor's team also hear this presentation, um, since it's going to be an ongoing conversation between the Council and the Mayor about, about these funds. So just want to recognize them here. Um, and uh, now I'll go to Councillor Murphy. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm super proud of all of you. You did an amazing job. And to Councillor Baker, you had mentioned the OFD stickers. I like the slid ones, still living in Dorchester. <laughs> and I am super proud that I live in D3 and that you are my city councillor. So thank I you. I only put Frank Baker bumper stickers on I my I know, account. I know you do, but you know, <laughs> born and raised in Dorchester, form. I'm very proud that you're here and you're advocating and you brought this together. So we are here for you, so thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Councillor Louis Chan. Thanks, Councillor. <laughs> I follow the rules. I'm a lawyer. Um, okay. Um, you, you guys are phenomenal. Like, I just feel like this generation, I'm like really glad I'm not your counterparts because you guys would have just blown me out of the water. The kids just seem, you guys just seem to be on it and with it and just like present so well. And I'm just so excited for our future because you all are at the lead. So thank you so much. Um, I hope, I just am excited to watch all of you bloom and just fly and soar and just take over this city. Um, I have a few questions about the BCLA merger um, with the McCormick and how that's going to add a lot more students to the area um, and how have discussions gone 
with uh, the principals at those institutions to think about how um, this project is going to complement the influx of students. Um, and how has that, because you know the BCLA merger was not always part of the plan, and now it is. How has that influenced or impacted uh, your vision for the project and also accessibility to the students? Because these students have really lofty visions for what accessibility to the public will look like. And so just curious to hear your thoughts both on the BCLA issue and, and accessibility to the public. Okay, <clears throat> thanks for that question, Councillor. Um, so I can't speak for BCLA, but I would say is that we're having discussions around the use that the students are going to get, and it'll be significant. You know, Andrea is uh, very excited about this project uh, from BCLA McCormick, and we've and you know what what I have heard uh, is that the facilities right now, especially at, to, to your point, uh, more students coming there, the facility as it is now is is lacking. I, I think that's really not top secret. Um, but more students coming in, the need for more uh, facilities like this is important. So I, I just think for the purpose of BPS and, and those schools, my perspective is this is a home run for them. You know, be, be you know, assured of our commitment to those students and the faculty. Um, it's there, it's real, and um, it, this is going to be a great benefit to those students and those schools. I'll, I'll add one thing that... Um Bob, you may have missed it. We had um, conversations like a working group with BCLA, McCormick, um, Dever team members, Andrea and, and her counterparts on that campus after that merger was introduced, um, before we went to BPDA and before our final Article 80 plans were developed. So in concert with them, we were going through some of the changes you see here with the input from the youth, with the input from them um, in a working group setting. And I'll also add, uh, this is a, a process that's going on. It's a monthly process of meeting with uh, Andrea and, and other uh, members developing the curriculum at, at BCLA. We're at the point right now of exchanging information about the specific number of seats in, in the theater, um, the flex rooms. Um, so they're analyzing the, how this sort of works within that uh, model that they're developing at the school. Um, and we're in the process of, of design right now where we can accommodate a lot of uh, little things that, that actually mean a lot to the teaching curriculum. Great, uh, thank you. Um, second question is um, in one of the letters from the community, I think it's one of the uh, Harbor Point community groups, they talk about uh, uh, how we can maximize retaining outdoor space. Um, and one of the proposals was potentially, you know, especially we're gonna have this influx of, influx of students from BCLA with hopefully a really successful merger. Um, and you know, it's great to have a facility where you can do a lot of outdoor things indoor, but we also wanna make sure we're maximizing outdoor space if the pandemic has taught us anything. Um, so wondering if there are possibilities as proposed in that letter from Harbor Point about you know, potentially retaining some of the outdoor space by shifting parking, especially in including parking underground. Um. Well, that, that is, has been uh, brought up frequently, the underground parking, and I think that that um, comes at a significant cost. And we've shared that in, in meetings uh, with the individuals that, that have asked those questions. Um, and we, we feel like the, the direct costs um, that would be borne on this project, that would come at a cost of f functional program spaces inside. Uh, we just don't think it's worth lifting the building up more to, to go through that expense. Um, however, the parking in, in this day and age is being, it's very uh, controversial in terms of how right. much we are relying on cars. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the new population of the school and the way that we're also becoming less reliant on cars, we feel confident and uh, um, that the plan to repurpose the parking lot in the back of the building um, can be uh, done, envisioned in the future as, as more outdoor space. So we're already in a flexible mindset. We have to accommodate some parking on this site. Um, but the BCLA McCormick campus is also understanding their own parking needs as well. So there may be trade-offs and there may be sharing of parking for their teachers and staff. Um, but at this point, um, Putting it underground is, is, is becoming more and more difficult from a cost perspective. Do you have an approximate, do you, has it run any numbers on what that would look like? 
um, how much cost it would. Yeah, to shift parking. To um, it would. It would. Um, it would be in the neighborhood of uh, an additional five to seven million, okay. just because of uh, it, it impacts and creates more steel and a whole other floor to, to add to this. Um, so um, it, it is. We can provide some more specificity on that. Um, and what that what that means to um, Environment, that. environmental impacts. Yes, it's also um, on the edge of a uh, flood flood zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so. In addition to being accessible, this is also a resilient building. So we're pulling it up out of the, the flood plate to an elevation that um, plus an additional two feet beyond that. So anything going underground starts to really complicate everything. And, and um, the work that we've done has really been to, to make this building more vertical, more compact, um, and uh, take up less space. You know. Okay, thank you. And then one last question is, speaking of, since you mentioned resiliency, the Dorchester Bay City project that's happening, have you thought about what integration or what effect that project would have on this project? Um, on, on resiliency climate change? Yes, uh, this, this has really been, been seen, and that's another part of this deliberate process with the community we've gone through. Uh, the, the kind of planning that they're doing with other projects out and all over Dorchester and all over the city is very, much aware of exactly what flood elevation you're at. Um, so we mentioned that already, how the building's raised to that level. Um, but it comes into other things. There's community resiliency. There's the potential for this building to be a cooling center during really hot times of the year. That, that doesn't exist in Dorchester right now. Um, also, just a safe place, uh, potentially during blizzards. Um, but but the building is robust and it's expensive for those reasons. Um, and we're also uh, looking at achieving a, an extremely low energy use intensity uh, value here and working with the state through their rebate programs to, to make this just uh, resilient in every single way possible. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you. Um, Salaam alaikum Fatima. <laughs> And peace and love to all of you. Um, I second my colleague's uh, comment about how brilliant you guys are. You are smarter than us. And I just want to know <laughs> who's running for office here? <laughs> that, was my, that was my question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, when I grow up, I want to be a human rights lawyer. And then I want to run for Senate and then run for president. A whole plan. <laughs> Inshallah, it's going to actualize exactly as you plan it. I want to be an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> um, my questions are about, um, I mean, Boston is such a diverse city, and I, I really think that, you know, the children in this area deserve it, and we should be building facilities that, um, like this one. I wonder, though, um, wh what is your intention to address uh, culture um, in, in this development? I would say, first of all, when you think about Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester, oh, I'm sorry, was that for me or the kid, kids? <laughs> That's for anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> um, uh, we're a very diverse organization, and, and we're very proud of it. It's a staple of uh, who we are at Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. And I think, obviously, when you see the existing demographics of our organization uh, in the communities that we serve, um, it, it's, it's natural. You know, I've always said our, our building on Deer Street, which has been referenced a few times, it's amazing, the location. It's, it's central to so many neighborhoods that are kind of different in different ways but so welcoming to all the different uh, uh, cultures uh, that make up Dorchester. So, um, you know, this, this facility is for kids in the city. So, you know, we're very proud of our uh, diversity of our clubs. I have to um, agree with you that Boys and Girls Club does tremendous work. And it does serve a very diverse population. And I really appreciate your programs. I've had to support so many families, hundreds of families, throughout 27 years of human service work, um, referring people there, picking people there, or bringing them resources from Boys and Girls Club. I really appreciate what you do. I think that the cultural component has to be a little bit more intentional. 
and I wonder not just flags or not just you know holidays, but I wonder if there's a space for cultural competency, inclusion, and diversity um, in a way that it manifests in, through the arts, or maybe it's a, a welcoming environment or a space that is sort of a cultural room, shared sort of universal type of room, um, where it's more intentional. So I, I, I encourage you to think through that. Um, and then my second part, part of that is we, we feel that every school should have what you're envisioning, right? And BPS has a hard time doing this. For some reason, we, we all have that question, why can't BPS do this? And so if the funds are to go somewhere to you, and I, I, I like that you broke down the disparities. I like that you showed the need. I wonder then, if we're intentional about that, then that means that we actually have to hire populations that represent that demographic that we serve. So I would like to see a plan for that intentionality. How are you planning to hire and monitor equity throughout this process? Because BPS already has a hard time doing that too. Um, and so I wonder how are we doing that? If we are, if we are building businesses that serve a population because of these such disparities, then shouldn't we be hiring people or creating economic mobility of some sort for the very people that we serve? Uh, thanks for those uh, great observations. I think the cultural space, we'd love to talk to you about that and, and get some really good ideas around that, and we'll include our friends here, of course. Um, so I think, that, I think that's a really great idea. Uh, at Boys and Girls Hubs of Dorchester, we hire uh, the majority of the people who work for us. They're from the community, the vast majority. And interestingly enough, a lot of um, those who come to work with us uh, were members at the club once upon a time. Can uh, so I look here, right here? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's important to us. And I mean, a lot of the full-time professional staff that we have were members at the club. Maybe they went off to college and came back, um, but it's a large percentage. So we hire from within the community, and it's really important to us. And the staffing should, should reflect the, the rich diversity of, of our clubhouses. But your upper management too, right? so that it's also reflective in the upper management. Yeah. Um, and then I guess to connect with that is, what is your job, is there like a youth job component um, to this program? And I'm sorry if I missed that. Yeah, the, well the youth job component is, is pretty uh, robust. Um, we're really fortunate to have a lot of partners we work with year round, but in particular in, in the summer, we actually hire 125 uh, Boston youth to work at our three clubhouses. So we're really proud of that, it's pretty cool. And uh, that program's been extended like year round, but not, not at those kinds of, of numbers. Um, but uh, the summer jobs that we get for the youth are really significant. Obviously 125 kids is a lot of kids. Thank you. And um, Fatima and the other girls, I only have sons. Tell your parents, I will take you home. You guys are cute, you guys are too cute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Fernando Anderson. Um, I have a few questions, but then I want to get. We have a bunch of public testimony waiting, including some more members of these advisory boards. So, um, I'll, I'll ask just a few questions, and then I'll just check with councillors to make sure nobody's got any follow-ups, and then we'll go to public testimony. And again, for the folks who are here on Zoom, we know you're here too, and we will get to you as well. Um, so, I guess just um, I wondered if you could speak. Just tell me a little bit more about, I know there was mention of the fact that all the students at the Dever McCormick would become members. Um, can you, for you know, the folks who might be watching at home who don't know what being a member of a Boys and Girls Club ent entitles you to, what it means about your ability to use the facilities, et cetera, is it, do you still need to book times? Like, how does the whole thing, can you just speak to that a little bit more? <laughs> Girls Clubs, there we go, sorry. Um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, to become a member, uh, you know, it just gives you full access to our programs. So it's $5 a year. There's a membership application that needs to be filled out. Um, and, uh, and that's really important part of the process. So for example, with the, with the schools, 
um, the school's gonna work with us to help enroll those children into our full program. Um, and then it's, you know, programs are broken down by age, um, and that's how the scheduling is done at the club. So, um, like literally we start at infants, uh, infant toddler preschool and our early education programs, those are separate from the membership, but five years old to 19, and in fact older than 19 in many cases, uh, children can uh, access all the programs that we have that are age appropriate for them whether it's the sports leagues, the music lessons, the art classes, uh, on and on, the education programs, and drop into our clubs. And, and I mean, it's that simple. They drop in and they participate in the activities that we have scheduled for those days. So some programs are open, like just kind of open, drop in, and others you pre-register for. Right. Yeah, and, and I would just um, stress that I think that, you know, I think this the site's on a ground lease from the Boston Public Schools um, and uh, as was mentioned by Councillor Louis Jen, right, we've got these two schools merging at that site. Um, so I think that, you know, in, I know you guys, it's, I know it sounds like you've already been working with the schools on what kind of a memorandum of agreement type thing would look like, but I think it would be very important for this council if the, if the city was supporting this project to really make sure that that access for students was stellar, right? And so it's like, it's access, it's membership, but like you just mentioned, making sure that everybody's getting that application actually filled out so they're really in. I also think that understanding um, how, how the schools access like during the day when programs aren't running, um, like would be guaranteed and secure would be really important because I mean, we heard from a couple of you guys who are McCormick grads, right? And um, I, I think we, we would really want like things like that, the theater space and the courts and all of that to be accessible like in those daytime schools. So I just think, I think that's gonna be a, that's probably an item for kind of follow up, but I think it's very important to the council, especially if we were to talk about putting further, further public funds in addition to the ground lease structure into this. Okay, and, and of course at the end of the day, it's, it, it's all about the kids, it's about those students who are gonna be served. Um, but those, so those are the details we're talking about, and uh, you know, obviously we, we could share that the, the MOU w with all of you. But you know, you just have our assurances that during the day, th those facilities will be open to those students. Great, yeah, no, and that'll be we'll we'll do that follow up uh, on the committee side. Okay. Um, can you guys also speak a little bit to just there was a reference to it, but I'm not sure we really laid out the. Um, there's sort of a, a prospect for potential math matching funds from the state. Um, in legislation up at the state house, can somebody speak to that? Just so it's on the record here. Sure. The governor introduced um, his supplemental budget that would include a um, hundred million dollar pool of money across the state, ten million dollars um, to to the city of Boston for a facility of this nature. Um, if in fact the city were to, or there was matching funds coming from the city side, um, it has not yet been adopted into a supplemental budget. Um, there is uh, work being done with your colleagues um, up at the State House on how that works itself out. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to put my hat on of speculating as to why that hasn't happened yet, but I, I imagine that they're looking to understand the commitment from the City of Boston and, and all of you and validating the fact that this, in fact, is something that should happen, will happen, and that, you know, your, your validation, your support of it allows them the opportunity to move forward. Thanks. Um, and then my question for the Youth Advisory Board members is if you guys could talk about, because I think, um, Jessica, you mentioned, you know, interviewing other folks, you know, talking to your community about what people might want. So in this process, kind of, um, like, what's one thing that you you sort of feel like you've learned through the process, you know, where you, you heard an idea you hadn't thought of before from somebody else, or maybe even another member on the Youth Advisory Board, or um, kind of something occurred to you along the way that you hadn't thought about at the beginning. I'm always interested in how, how you know, these processes change us as we change them. So curious if you guys have any thoughts on that. Um, I guess I could start. Uh, one thing for me that sort of hit me as I was working on this is, um, uh, as someone who goes to BC High, as I mentioned before, we do a lot of service hours, and so we do a lot of work with that. And I'm actually all my service hours have been with the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, and so that sort of led me to think like, why don't we try to create like a positive relationship between BC High and all the schools in the area around the field house, um, especially if I mean the BC High mission statement is to be you know men and people for others, 
So I've, in my mind, I, I sort of thought this is the perfect opportunity to sort of integrate between BC High students and kids in the community because a lot of these students are coming from outside of the city and a lot of them really don't have exposure to a lot of these different cultures and identities. And I feel like not only will that help serve the people of the field house, but it'll also help educate the students who may be uh, ignorant to a lot of different cultures and experiences. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, something that I realized along the way is that like people really do care about what we have to say. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times, I've never been like included really young. First, I was 12 when we started this project. I've never been like included into something where people actually want to hear what I want to say. Like, we had so many opportunities where we got to share our ideas, give feedback, and get to be involved in such a huge project that I know will like impact so many people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. To add on to Fatsumato Saint, um, something that I learned throughout this experience was working together. Like, it wasn't just, oh, we hop on Zoom, we're going to do this by ourselves. It was a community project. We all set our input piggyback. If we didn't, if, like, if we didn't like something, we'll work on it, fix it, come back next week, and boom. Like, we told the architects, landscape, this is what we wanted, and now it's happening. So, thank you. Yeah, to go off of what they were saying, like, I just think that, like, being a part of this whole process, like, and just being able to share our ideas with one another and just coming together as a group, as a whole, like, and just supporting one another in, in such a big way for such a big project like this and that's gonna be so important to the community, I think is really important. Great, well, thank you all so much. Um, do counselors have any other follow-up questions before we go to more testimony? Oh yeah, Councilor louis -Jen. One question, and uh, I'm a new city councilor, so I've only been here three months, so I'm still learning. Um, I, I think the question is in part, kind of maybe for my colleagues, uh, others with institutional knowledge, has the city subsidized or uh, helped support a private youth supporting project in this way in the past at this time? I know the ARPA funds are new, so we've never had like this flow of cash before, at which we can choose to do, but in terms of what we've done historically, where does, would this be a first time thing? Would this be, you know, in line with what we've done in the past? Just, just for some of the old timers, tell us new ones, what, how, how it goes. I heard old timers. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we, we give, and this isn't a private, this isn't a private business endeavor. This is, this is a non a uh, non private. Yeah, so, not, not yeah, public. we, we, yeah. since I've been here, we've supported numerous nonprofits, but not to this extent. and and not, not to build assets, which I think the APA money is more towards building assets that, that can become something greater than just the money that's there. So yeah, we, every year we'll have, in the budget, we'll have money going towards nonprofits, supporting nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I mean. But at this scale, no, this is no, the first time No, this because there's never, there's never been this type of money around here. Mm -hmm. and, and the APA money is, is different. It's, it's, it's supposed to, speak to um, not just COVID, but everything else that's been going on and everything else that we're coming, that we're reckoning with. So, and I think this is, this is gonna speak to that. So, it, um, big money, big changes. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. If that answered your question, I'm not really sure. Perfect. But yeah, we, we, we give nonprofits money all day long. And, and Councilor Lujan, I'm happy also to take on for the committee just doing a little bit of a scan and figuring out if what the past cases would be. Um, I, I suspect that the, there's probably a case before of the city putting money into a nonprofit capital project, but as was mentioned, probably not at this scale. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor fernandez Hutchison. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with uh, my colleague, um, um, Council Baker, if not to this magnitude, but then, or this extent, but then, if we're supporting nonprofits and it's for a marginalized community and COVID is technically to recover or to work on pre-existing conditions or issues um, that marginalized communities face to uh, better prepare us or to strengthen the community so that we deal with it differently. 
Um, and I think then it sets precedence to how we move forward as well, right? Then we look at, for example, Mattapan that gets almost close to nothing. And I'm very interested to look into this budget coming this um, tomorrow uh, to see, to compare what Mattapan is getting in comparison to the more affluent communities, right? And then, so this project shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't say no to a project because it's a good thing or just because it's in Frank Baker's district or just because it's in Dorchester. We shouldn't say no to it for those reasons. If it's good, it's good. Remember what I told you last time? Mm -hmm. And if it's bad, it's bad. <laughs> so it's a good thing that can help a lot of people. And then therefore, we set precedents to build equity. This means that we then use this example and move to Mattapan and move to Roxbury and move to Grove Hall and all these other areas and do the same. So I, I applaud you for your courage to do it this way. I don't know why we're in a hearing instead of uh, just asking for it, but. Um, I can talk to you about that in private. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. You see, you're taking notes, Fatima? But, but, but it's, it's, if I can, a bit. Um, I think a lot about my district. I think a lot about how the district gels together, about infrastructure for me isn't, si isn't just sidewalks and, and, and streets. Right. Infrastructure is, is for these guys to be able to have things that, that, that they know is theirs and, and is gonna make them better people and surround them, surround, so the infrastructure for me is everything is, let me see how I put this. Um, the infrastructure is more than just the roads and the, and the, and, the, and I've talked about right. this a lot, like when it, when, when it comes to how development dollars are spent in my community, I talked to the developers about, I want to define what infrastructure is, because if you're going to put money into infrastructure, for me, infrastructure can be job training, can be, can be this here, it can be, you know, a, a, it can be a good playground, all those things, anything that we can put into any community to enhance the lives of the kids that are coming up behind us. I mean, uh, I'm on the back end, not technically on the back end, but I'm in my 50s now, so I'm not looking for sports facilities. You know, I'm, I'm just not. I would have loved this when I was 15. I would have been at this club 8 o'clock in the morning, They'd be throwing me out. What I did at my community center, I went there the minute the door opened and they threw me out at the end of the night. <clears throat> and this is what we need to do for them. This is, this, is, this is the convergence of what we've become in the last 30 years where we all played on terrible fields, terrible gyms, and we're still just catching up. This is state of the art. This is using technology, this is using architecture, and this is, this is us reaching for something more. This is us saying that we deserve more. You know, BC High, BC High, as I said it earlier, I don't, uh, um, BC High is getting ready to build new fields and build these things, and the kids at the Dever and the McCormick are gonna look across the street over the fence and say, wish we had a little bit of that. You know, they're gonna have a little bit of that here. And I know that the, 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 the Dever and the McCormick and the Cash School, I believe it's cash going in are gonna have access to this because I know the club. I know who's in the club. I know who works at the club. Sometimes I go to the hop with the people from the club and we have conversations. So I think about this stuff a lot and I'm thinking about <clears throat> the generations that are coming behind me and not just my kids. I'm thinking about everybody, you know, and how we mesh this fabric together. I'm, I'm concerned about not just Boston in the future, not just the country in the future, like where are all of our communities going? Your wisdom is showing. Maybe that means you're just getting old and wiser. Yeah, it's a gray hair. I was gonna shave my head, but I was afraid it was gonna come back all white, so I didn't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, but yeah, the infrastructure should be, should be um, defined as more than just roads and bridges. This is infrastructure here, in my opinion. Job training is infrastructure. Building. Second 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. All right. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate you guys. <laughs> and the adults, too. Next time, don't <laughs> um, And um, all right. And so what we'll do is we'll ask the, the panelists um, to go back to the seating, and then I'll start calling folks down. And so if you're up, sign up for public testimony, you can come down to either of these microphones that are on the floor. Um, just so folks know, so the first person will be Bill Richard, joining us from the Martin Richard Foundation. Um, then I've got Diane um, uh, Licentious, um, uh, uh, who I think is an autism community parent. And then um, I've got uh, from the Boys and Girls Club, and guys, everyone's gonna have to pronounce their names and correct me, um, but I've got Alois Correa, Alessito Sal, Jamil Boykin, Cordell Givens, Gabby Gold, Samantha Sierroco, and then we will um, go to the Zoom. So, and I'll, I'll read those names off as well. Um, so I'm, uh, and, all right, excellent. And now, so I'm gonna go um, without further ado to uh, Mr. Um, did you wanna, yeah, okay, yeah, to Mr. Bill Richard from the, um, from the Martin Richards Foundation. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Um, I can't hear well. I hope you can. This is okay, right? Um, my volume's okay? Yeah, you're great. Thank we can you. hear you. Uh, thank you for providing me the time to speak on this matter. Um, get a little personal. We are just nine uh, days away from the ninth anniversary of the bombings on Boylston Street that killed Martin. Those who know me know I don't speak of that day, certainly not in a public forum. Um, however, Denise and I feel it's important to reflect on why we do what we do. Martin's message of no more hurting people peace is a gift. In his name, we've been able to create not just a charitable foundation, but a movement. His message brings people together. Martin recognized the importance of equal opportunity and the sense of making everyone feel valued. We work hard to advance our values, which were his values. Sportsmanship. Martin was passionate about fair play. He insisted on it. Inclusion. Martin never allowed a lesser player to be the last pick. Never. Kindness. Martin had a charm about him making him an easy friend to his peers and grown-ups. <clears throat> and the stories about Martin striking conversations with homeless folks are real. In peace, in case you didn't know, Martin made his famous sign in response to the murder of Trayvon Martin. Our work is very grassroots, but at the same time, we do allow ourselves to think big. The Martin Richard Institute for Social Justice at Bridgewater State University. Its mission to build knowledge about social justice and develop skills for advancing social justice through individual and collective action. This year, what would be Martin's senior year? We awarded our first, first excuse me, we awarded our first four-year four scholarship to a student from the Neighborhood House Charter School in Dorchester. These students will tie their academic interests to social justice, civic engagement, and community service. Martins Park in the Seaport District, a wonderful blend of play, space, and nature, an inclusive and climate resilient park for Boston and visitors far and wide. But today we're here to advocate for the Dorchester Fieldhouse. Our name, Martin's name, is attached to this project because we believe this is an equity issue this incredible youth development facility that will be operated by the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester will serve underprivileged kids and families, prioritize mental health and wellness, close the opportunity gap, support kids and families with IDD and physical disabilities, create space for kids and families from all backgrounds to thrive. As we remind folks, just because a space is accessible does not make it inclusive. This should be the standard in Boston. 
Our partners at BPS, our kids at BPS, our communities deserve this investment. It's been mentioned a few times, just last week, right next door, BC High got a single gift of $49 million to construct new facilities for their kids, and good for them. We share, Councillor Banker, we share the, the responsibility for the rest of these kids and families. Let's work together and deliver this sorely needed resource to Boston's kids. Martin's message brought people together at a time when many didn't know what the hell to do. We know what to do. Let's get this done. Let's build Boston up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Richard. And um, thank you for everything that you and your family. I think we're all we're all thinking of your family, especially this week, and just very grateful for all of the things that um, that you've chosen to do with um, with Martin's memory. So thank you. Um, next up is Diane Lishinkas, and then it'll be Elois Correa. And uh, there were a couple people I neglected to read earlier. We've got Richard Conway, and then Haley Dillon uh, from Senator Collins' office uh, on the list for in person. And then in a minute, I'll read the online list as well. Um, Diane, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me and allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Diane Lashinskis. I'm a resident in Dorchester. I uh, currently work for the Massachusetts Autism Commission, and I spent 10 years on the board of SPEDPAC for Boston Public Schools, as well as the um, Inclusion Task Force that had been formed. I'm very passionate about inclusion as my oldest um, daughter Alexa, who's 25, has an intellectual disability and was afforded the opportunity to attend the Henderson School and be included, which changed the course of her life. Um, I attended the club as a child and I'm lucky enough to still be in walking distance to the club. My three daughters have been members and continue to uh, participate in club activities. I have also worked closely with the Martin Richard Foundation on creating challenger sports. I still am a volunteer coach and I have run for their charity team. Not, not this year, those days are done. <laughs> we, know their, we know the missions of the Boys and Girls Club and the Martin Richard Foundation al aligned, we know this. And this field house will represent that and more. Tonight I wanna talk about inclusion and the intentional efforts both organizations are infusing into the planning and design of the field house. The Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester is currently fully inclusive, ensuring that our most vulnerable youth are included in programming each and every day. And when I say vulnerable, I, I mean our kids with moderate to severe disabilities who so many programs across the city turn away. And I know that because of my own daughter, but I also know it for the families who I continue to work with today. As a former director of inclusion at the club, I can attest to the major efforts put forward by the staff in creating programs so that everyone could benefit from all that was offered of the club. Life changing for so many, and it doesn't happen often. I just want to pause here and I just want to share a story that Bob will remember. Um, when I was working at the club, we had um, someone who worked at the club who, was in a, who used a wheelchair and she couldn't get up to the second floor where everyone played basketball and we had just created a basketball inclusive program. And Bob and I talked and we said we can't move forward unless we have wheelchair access. So it was before the ADA compliance. Bob agreed, we found the money, and we worked with um, an architect who did universal design. And they built a lift which is currently on the outside of the building to ensure that anyone and everyone could come into that building. It wasn't perfect, but it's all that we could do. It just shows you the commitment. Bill Richard invited me as a consultant on this project because a team wanted to be sure inclusion in the design wasn't an afterthought. That is how important inclusion is to both organizations and who they serve each day. Why is inclusion important? Too many of our youth and families get turned away from opportunities because organizations are not equipped to best serve their needs. I hear stories from families all the time and it makes it difficult for them to go to work as they need to be home for their loved ones. Oh, did I, okay. That their loved ones who have been turned away either from a school program or a nonprofit. They may not have the staff, the resources, or the training to work with our youth with disabilities. These same students may also be educated in substantially separate programs throughout our schools and with very little opportunities to be included in the community. 
We know the data of educating our students in substantially separate settings, and we know what those outcomes are. We know this. We know that Boston Public Schools, and there is so much data on kids who start in substantially separate programs with very, very little opportunity to be included, we know where they end up. But let's look at the outcomes of individuals who've been educated and included in inclusive settings, as being included helps you better prepare for adulthood. I work for the state now, and I know, and I know these numbers. If we do not prepare them today, they will fail tomorrow. The field house will welcome them and is being designed with their needs in mind. When my daughter was very young, I signed her and her sister up for a Saturday dance class, not at the club, somewhere else. And my oldest daughter, who has an intellectual a, a, a disability, and I was told after her first session of the dance group that she was not welcome back due to her disability, but they would take my other daughter. I pulled them both, and they started going to the Boys and Girls Club. That message I received from the dance instructor hurt deeply. This is the message that too many of the city's after-school programs give to families. It is the experiences that we take away from every opportunity that's afforded to us that help to shape us in who we are today. The Fieldhouse is prepared to offer those experiences to everyone. Neither one of my daughters are professional dancers today. Um, they were given great opportunities at the club, and my daughter Alexa was also employed for multiple summers at the club, and, that need, and they need, she needed support. And I worked with Boston Public Schools, but I essentially worked with the club, who was the first group to step up and offer my daughter a job. And because of that, she is currently employed. Giving support and resources where needed. Let's think about the message the field, field House will send to all of our youth when we open the doors for everyone. My daughter was included in school. She attended the Henderson until the day she turned 22. She was included at the club and is now successful in her own right. She works with a job coach. She has many friends. One of her friends is Jessica Martin, who's here today. And she continues to participate in the Martin, Martin Richard Challenger Sports Program, even though she's 25 and technically you have to be 19, but they allow her to do that because that's who they are. Life-changing for her and some of her success is because she was given opportunity and she was included. So let's change the course and change the lives of our youth, all of our youth. Let's give them opportunity to thrive, try new things, take chances, get a job, and be connected to something great. I will end with a quote that I love, um, that I've used before to describe inclusion. It's not my quote, it's someone else's quote. Inclusion is not just being asked to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. So I hope this goes through, we get the dance party started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, next up is Elvis uh, Correa, and then uh, I've got Elsa too, um, and then Jamil. So Elsa too, if you wanna come down to this one and be ready. Um, Elvis, you have the floor. Hi, my name is Elvis, and I'm part of the Youth Advisory Board. And a little bit more about the Youth Advisory Board, as they said, um, with the Youth Advisory Board, we've met every two weeks, every Wednesday. Um, we talk together. We've, my, my favorite part about the Youth Advisory Board is getting information from the communities, getting information from parents on what they think of what we're working on. And that was the best part, honestly, and that what we were most included in, which was very important. What most excites me about this <laughs> is the gym. <laughs> the gym at the field house. Um, it'll be good to go to, not go to Planet Fitness for a change. Um, I see a lot of my peers, my teammates. Um, I do play soccer and I run track. Um, when we play outside, it's not, usually we don't have access to fields, but getting this project going, and I know we'll use it in the future. Maybe it won't be built by the time we're still playing, but I know we'll use it and friends will use it. And I think it'll be very accessible to a lot of athletes. Um, why do I think this uh, facility is needed? One reason the facility is needed is to bring people together. We currently live in a world where there's so much bad. Not that there's not any good, but there's a lot of bad. And this just adds to the goodness of the world. Um, I think the facility of the field house is going to be like the city of City Hall here, um, which is an important part of Boston, and the field house is going to be another important, important part of Boston, one of the biggest part of Boston eventually. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, counselors. Thank you, everybody, for hearing me. Great. Thank you so much, Elvis. Uh, next up is 
Alexis, Alexis Hu, and then uh, Jamil. If you can Hello. Come down here. Oh, oh um, my name is Isa Tu, and I'm also part of the Youth Advisory Board. And I want to say like thank you for having us here, and I'm honored to be a part of this group and being able to like share our voices up in this investment really shows like how good the community is and how we can improve together and like get also get back to the community knowing that I've been here been with the boys and girls club since I was 6 so like having that support system is really good and also making sure others around Boston have that support system is good even now like the Boys and Girls Club allows like college help or like involvement with like autism and other stuff. So I think with that, others can have that support, not only at home, but at the Boys and Girls Club or like if places like school, like they don't receive that help, the Boys and Girls Club can bring that to need. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll go now to Jamil, and then next up for Jamil will be Cordell Givens. So Cordell, if you want to come down and be ready, um, and then it's Gabby Gold after that. Jamil, you have the floor. Hello. Thank you, counselors, for attending. My name is Jamil Boykin. I'm a 19-year-old freshman at Wentworth Institute of Technology, and I'm a member of the Youth Advisory Board. Last year, during COVID, I got an email from Mike to apply and be a part of this team, and I honestly thought, it was just gonna be a one-time thing where I say, oh, I would like to see a basketball court, a kitchen, and a classroom in a new building, and that'd be it. But the meetings kept coming, and our involvement grew as time went on. And I didn't believe we would ever be in City Hall to be able to talk to you guys. And it's a very big accomplishment to me, because it's something that I can go home and tell my parents about. Say, I was at City Hall, not, not for the wrong thing, but for the right thing, to help something <laughs> be made. And I know from the memories from growing up at the club that I can know that my kids will be able to tell me about the memories they have, about the sports teams they was on, and it will go on from kids to grandkids and generations to come. And I'm just excited to finally go from this is not a dream, but reality. And I can say, I can call my friends and tell them, hey, let's go to the Dorchester Fieldhouse right by UMass, you know. We can go play basketball, go learn how to cook. Just be able to be in a safe environment where we can not worry about our lives being taken and enjoying the moment that we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Jamil. Um, next up, Cordell, and then I've got Gabby Gold. So Gabby, if you want to come down, and then after Gabby, I've got Samantha Sierra. Oh, um, Cordell? Hello, so my name is Cordell Givens. I go to Wentworth Institute of Technology and I'm part of the Youth Advisory Board. The thing I enjoyed most about being part of the program is knowing that we're doing something good for the community, you know? And like, I think a lot of people from Dorchester will benefit from the field house. Not just from Dorchester, but all around Boston too. I feel like everybody, including us, we all deserve this. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Cordell. Uh, now Gabby's up next, Gabby Gold, and then we've got Samantha Sierrojo. Um, so Samantha, if you wanna come down to the other one, that'd be great. Gabby, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabby Gold. Currently, I am a freshman at Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and I was a member of the Youth Advisory Board. Um, what I really enjoyed about the Youth Advisory Board was just the ability to work on a project that would have such a large impact on the community and bring so many people together. I never thought in all the years that I'd been alive that I would ever be part of something so big or so important to the community. Right now, I work at the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester in the fitness department we have over on um, Dot Ave. And working at the club, even for the short amount of time that I have um, so far, has really sh not so much taught me, but shown me just how important having these facilities and these programs is for these children. Being a, being a staff has really made me see that you want 
I hope I speak for every staff at the Boys and Girls Club when I say that you want the best for these kids. You want them to have everything that they could ever, ever ask for, ever dream for. And that's what this field house is going to bring. That's what it's going to have for this community. I hope that the kids coming into the field house will enjoy being there, will want to be there every single day. I want the best for them, and I want them to be excited about this just as I am. So thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, next up, Samantha, and then I think it's um, uh, maybe Father Conway. Um, and, uh, and then we've got Haley Dillon, and then on the Zoom, I've got Charlie Rose, Jorge Diaz, Paul Burton. Uh, uh, someone's here from all Dorchester Sports uh, League, and then um, Callie Ahern as well. So we're, we've got, we see you guys, and we're coming to you. Um, but next up is Samantha. Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Samantha Sirocco. 12 years ago, I moved to Boston from a very small Midwestern town because I thought this was the best city to live in. And I don't think I was wrong. I lived in Beacon Hill, the North End, Roxbury, really spread myself out there southy for a bit. Um, and then six and a half years ago, I got a call that I needed to take in my two nephews, who were six and two at the time. I had just graduated grad school and was terrified, but thought that we should move to Dorchester because in my six years of experience in Boston at that time, Dorchester was the place to go if you had kids. I would drive by seeing communities, like kids playing sports. I was like, oh, look at all these kids. You didn't see that in South or, you know, Beacon Hill or the North End. You saw tourists. Um, and I wasn't wrong, like Dorchester is a great place to have kids, but I had no clue what I was doing. Um, Boston Public Schools were not helpful. Um, the state, DTA, not helpful. And I'm a social worker, so I'm really good at filling out paperwork. <laughs> um, and then we had gotten the boys in this great school at the end of our street, um, Pope John Paul, and then my oldest nephew, who was seven at the time, started getting bullied pretty bad, and no one knew what to do. And the guidance counselor was like, you know what? Go to the Boys and Girls Club. Talk to Mary. See what she can do. I walked in and it instantly felt like I wasn't alone, that these kids were important, that they were cared for, that they would be okay. And I cannot imagine not being able, not having City Hall to like expand that throughout more of Dorchester. Like I got lucky getting sent their way. The kids are at the club right now actually, playing street hockey. Um, but you know, fast forward three years after we started going to the club and COVID hit. And I was working at MGH and Boston Hope 12 hours a day for seven days a week, did not see those kids. And the club gave them normalcy. They got to go there when they couldn't go to school. They got to see their friends, they got to see the staff. They got to see all of these role models still during the most terrifying period of our lives, at least in my generation. And having another facility to be able to hold on to that would be so amazing. I hope another pandemic doesn't happen. But if it does, the club's gonna be there to help that community. Now, me being fully immersed in all Dorchester, I'm on the board of directors for Dorchester Little League, have been for four years, and we can't find fields. We have no place to do spring training. We have crappy fields at some places, okay fields at the next, and then other great fields that we're fighting over with all these other sports leagues. And our partnership with the Boys and Girls Club allows us to have spring training, allows us to have clinics for t-ball when like the weather in March you know, no four or five year old wants to stand outside learning how to throw a ball. Um, and this will just be able to expand it for so many more organizations other than Dorchester Baseball. So I am so excited about the prospect of this. And in, you know, conclusion, there's this quote that I always refer to that, um, don't tell me what your values are, show me your budget, and then I'll tell you what your, your values are. And this is an example and an opportunity for this council to do that. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, going now to Father Conway and then um, Haley Dillon. Hi, 
My name is Father Conway, Madam Chairman, Frank, Councilors. I go by Doc, okay. <laughs> I first have a question for the Youth Advisory Board of the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club. My question is, will you welcome kids from Salty? <laughs> <laughs> the head nod, yes. <laughs> would, would you please convey that message to uh, Bill? Yes. I think he, all he talked about was Dorchester. He's from Southie, you know, the <laughs> council. That's, anyhow, that's all right. I've been in Dorchester for about 10 years, and my concern is the growing number of single parent families. And so a lot of kids just don't feel connected. And the connection so many of them get is the gang. Boys and Girls Club takes care of that. Everyone is welcome, even kids from Southie. <laughs> and they get to wear a uniform. They get to feel as though they're part of something. And I've observed different situations, games and things at the Boys and Girls Club. And one of the things that struck me, too, was the number of Boston police officers who volunteer their time there. I've observed those people playing basketball against special needs kids, or teaching boxing to special needs kids. And they're building this better relationship with the Boston police, some of whom are people that went through the Boys and Girls Club. And it's going to help to eliminate this crazy violence that's going on because the relationships are being built. So my thing is just not just support the Boys and Girls Club in this project, but don't try to come up with something new somewhere else in the city or somewhere else in the state. This works. Copy it. Copy it. Be humble enough to say, we're not as good as the Boys and Girls Club. We're going to copy their programs and make them work to help kids. Go for it. Thank you, Father. Uh, up next is Haley Dillon from Senator Nick Collins' office, and then, um, and then I'll be going to the Zoom. So we'll be going to Charlie Rose first on the Zoom. Um, Haley, you have the floor. Hi, Madam Chair and Boston City Councilors. I'm Haley Dillon, I'm Senator Nick Collins' legislative director. I'm here to speak in support and on behalf of State Senator Nick Collins, who is from Southie. Um, <laughs> State Representative Dan Hunt and State Representative David Beal. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and the Martin Richards Foundation have partnered to create a state-of-the-art fieldhouse at Columbia Point section of Dorchester that will represent. The Dorchester Fieldhouse represents once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create, oh sorry, I read the wrong word, <laughs> um, your development and healthy families. We support this proposal, which we will be welcoming to all, to all including those with disabilities, a, f a flexible on its use now and in the future. We also intend to advocate for matching funds on the state level and re respectfully request that this legislation be reported out of your committee favorably. Sincerely, Senator Collins, State Representative Dan Hunt, and State Representative David Beal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Haley. Um, and now we'll go, as I said, to the Zoom. Um, and I want to thank everybody on the Zoom for waiting so patiently. I know it's been a long time. Um, so first, we'll go to Charlie Rose, who's the Senior Vice President and Dean at City Year. Then it'll be Jorge Diaz, then Paul Burton, um, then uh, Callie Ahern, and then Candice Gartley um, from All Dorchester Sports. Um, so Charlie, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this has not been a long hearing at all. This has been totally inspiring. And I want to thank everybody who's participated, all the counselors. I want to particularly thank Fati and Hadi and Jessica and John and all the rest of the young leaders from the Youth Advisory Council. My name is Charlie Rose. I'm a lifelong youth worker. I spent 10 years working for the city of Boston under the Ray Flynn administration uh, in a department that's now called Boston Centers for Youth and Families. I helped found the street worker program. I worked in Columbia Point for many years. Um, I really appreciate Councillor Baker's vision and passion uh, in fact, on Mount Vernon Street, there's a facility named after a friend who I worked with for years, Walter Denny. 
Um, I've worked closely with Bill and Denise Richard and the Richard family for the last eight years. I'm also the chair of Project 351, where Bill and Denise have been instrumental in this youth development program. I, I want to make two points. One is building a world-class facility is fantastic and amazing and key. Running one, actually administering and running one is fundamental. And that's why, to me, this is a dream team with the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club and the Martin Richard Foundation together. And I believe the message of using ARPA funds in this way demonstrates Boston's commitment to generations in the, in the best possible way. And I just want to make a point about the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club. Bob Scannell is a legend in youth development. He and his team are legendary in terms of their integrity, their commitment, their care, and their results for decades. So let us build and run a world-class institution that stands for what we've heard tonight. Access, inclusion, equity, safety, freedom, community building, empowerment of young people, and a community facility we can all be proud of. And frankly, not just stands for those things, but as Bill Richard talked about, sets new standards, like the Challenger program has, like Martins Park has. So to me, I'll, I'll sum it up by saying this facility is a field house of dreams. Dreams that will be listened to, dreams that will be nurtured, and supported for generations. This will be the most, this is the most exciting development project in the city of Boston. And I know there's a lot of luxury things being built. I know there's a lot of facilities being built, but to me, this is the most important uh, project in the city. And I applaud the city councilor, the city council, because I, in hopes of them unanimously approving this request tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, next up is Jorge Diaz, and then it'll be Paul Burton. Jorge? How's everybody going? It's actually George uh, Kenzie. We met a long time ago at a fundraiser that you were having with uh, Billy Jones in uh, E13. Um, my name is uh, George Diaz. I've been a police officer for 25 years for the city of Boston, currently retired now, working at Northeastern. Um, I've been in law enforcement for well over 30 years. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, I want to actually probably bring out the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room it happens to be uh, black and brown children, right? Uh, you know, I have some statistics here that I looked up earlier today that, you know, since uh, January of this year, January 1st, uh, we've had six kids under the age of 17 shot, 21 arrested with firearms. Just last week alone, we had four kids who were 15 years old with firearms. This field house is not about necessarily for these children about anything but hope, right? Any child that lacks hope takes unnecessary risk, right? And that's what we're seeing, sadly, in this three and a half mile radius of Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. Um, I've seen the wonders of the Boys and Girls Club. It has nothing to do with, you know, as far as the inclusion, everybody is involved. Everybody loves everybody. Everybody takes care of one another. Uh, my son has been fortunate enough to have been part of the program for well over 10 years. Um, and I can't thank um, Bob and Bill and everybody else to uh, even include me uh, on this uh, special day to try and to speak about the field house. I think the field house is going to bring plenty of opportunities for these children to have other options, right? There's no other options out here. We took kids out of school in the seventh grade and we put them back into the ninth grade without an education, right? And so a lot of these poor kids are suffering. Um, as you know, we look at prices that are going up. So how are the people in these poor communities, how much are they suffering, right? So we really, it's really important that we kind of remember that. And I think I'd like to, you know, end my time with a, a quick story. And I think it's probably a story some people have already heard, but uh, it's the story about Bono and George Bush. So for those who have never heard that story, so the story is good in the sense that Bono hate, didn't like George Bush Sr. So Bono would always, at, during his concert, say, let's call George Bush, and they would never answer. So when George Bush Jr. got in, Bono really didn't like him. He didn't like the fact that he started a couple of wars. He didn't like, right? So. 
George Bush invited Bono to the White House and over a 45 minute lunch period, they sat down and came up with something that they did have in common. They, they knew that they weren't gonna agree on politics, but they knew that the people in Africa who were suffering from AIDS needed help. So George Bush would go ahead and put $15 million towards an organization called PERFER, right? The President's Emergency Response for AIDS Action Relief. Um, since those two decided to partner up on that, over 20, I think it's close to 20 million lives have been saved, right? I think that when we partner up together on the things that we do under, do agree upon, such as children need advantages, ch children need opportunities, children need chances, that I think that it's really a no-brainer on how many lives we can save. We may not save 21 million lives when we open up this, but if we save if there's currently 4,000 going to the Boys and Girls Club that are being saved, if we can save 10,000 children, right, that don't have to make the choice of picking up a firearm or selling drugs or putting themselves in bad situations, then we've accomplished a huge, huge mission. And for these kids, it's about life and death for these kids, right? It's not about just hope and opportunity, all right? So I really appreciate my opportunity to, to speak tonight, and I thank you very much. Um, and Frank, love you to death. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, George. Um, next up is Paul Burton, and then it'll be Callie Ahern, and then Candace. Uh, Paul? Thank you, counselors. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for hearing these beautiful young children speak about what their vision is, what their future holds at this incredible opportunity. You know, I, I'm coming to you on behalf of two things. One, I run the Ron Burton Training Village. Uh, where we partner with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. Our kids um, co collaborate with the children of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester, but I'm also a reporter for CBS, WBZ TV in Boston. So, you know, I interview so many of these kids in Dorchester whose lives are cut short because of a lack of vision, because of lack of inspiration. This field house literally will change the trajectory of not only the children, but the families as well, because they will be a part of this vision. They will be a part of this incredible project that definitely needs to be put forth. You heard Fatu, Hadi, Jessica, John all speak about what they enjoy most, what they will enjoy most about this field house, the stairs, the theater, the food, all that. These are, this is an opportunity for them to not only change their lives, but their brothers and sisters and friends and their neighborhood as well. At Ron Burton Training Village, we had the blessing of the Yaki Foundation building us a 60,000 square foot facility that we built in 2006. I can tell you it changed our program forever. It changed the legacy of what my father started back in 1985. We're still growing strong today. And the partnership that we would form with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester will provide us an opportunity to be in the city in those winter months where these kids really have nowhere to go. And I actually, today, as a reporter, I, I actually had the opportunity to walk into the New Balance, the track, unbelievable facility in Brighton. Uh, this 500,000 500, square foot facility in Brighton called the Track of New Balance, it is mind blowing. It is a game changer. And I thought to myself, this is what Dorchester needs. And they are building something similar to that. And the fact that these children will be able to walk to this facility just literally a stone's throw away where they can be there year round all the time. Well, I guarantee you, I speak as a person who has witnessed it firsthand, what these facilities can do for a nonprofit and what these facilities can do for these children. It gets them to dream big. It lets them know that they are special. I thought it was interesting that Fatu said just the stairs alone. When these kids walk into a brand new place, it's because they now they know and see firsthand that they are special and that they will maximize this opportunity and change their lives and their families' lives forever. So I say go ahead with it full throttle. Bob, you're amazing. Dot, you're amazing. The Richard Foundation, you guys are incredible. I cherish you all, and I really think that this is the best thing for Dorchester because I can tell you as a reporter, I'm so sick and tired of going to families and knocking on their doors, talking to the victims because they lost their loved ones to gun violence or what have you because of just a lack of opportunity and, and inspiration but all these children deserve it and they're hungry for it. They're ready for this opportunity and I hope you guys will bless them. God bless you all. Thank you so, thank you so much, Paul. Um, and I do, 
I do just, in a second I'm gonna go to Callie and Candice. I just wanna say, cause I got one inquiry. If you're looking to testify on the Zoom, um, you should email right now, ron, R-O-N dot cob, C-O-B-B at boston.gov, R-O-N dot C-O-B-B at boston.gov for the Zoom link. Cause once we finish the Zoom testimony, um, I'll, I'm gonna say a little bit about where we're going next. Um, and then we'll be wrapping up pretty shortly. So if you're looking to testify now is definitely the time. Um, uh, Callie Ahern, you have the floor. Hi, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I wasn't feeling that well, so I couldn't come in person, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Callie Ahern. I'm also part of the Youth Advisory Board. And being involved with the Youth Advisory Board has been something that I've never imagined. It's such an incredible opportunity. It was something I look forward to every week, every two weeks, and brainstorming ideas and being able to share them and being able to take what I learned from those meetings and bring them back with better ideas, um, just to collab with all the other people and meet so many new people was just such a great opportunity. And I'm super excited. One of the biggest things for me as well is the inclusivity. Um, I am also involved with the Challenger Sp Sports Program. I have been since it began and it's something I look forward to every single weekend. And when we can't have it, it's a bummer. And doing this program has changed my life and changed my perspective as a whole. I never knew that people were missed opportunities because of their differences. And it really opened my eyes and showed me that everyone should be included. And that's something that the Boys and Girls Club has always done and something that I look forward to in the field house. And I just know that this is gonna be an amazing project and it's gonna turn out and everyone can be a part of it. And I can't wait to take the opportunity and even though I will be going off to college after this year, I know that I'm leaving behind something that I was a part of for everyone. So thank you for giving me the time and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, next up, sorry, I lost my sheet. Uh, okay. We uh, next up is uh, Candice Gartley um, from or All Dorchester uh, Sports and Le Leadership. Candice, thank you. Nice to see everyone. Um, could I possibly be the closer this evening? I I would be so delighted to have that title. Um, my name is Candace Gartley. I am the executive director of All Dorchester Sports and Leadership located in Fields Corner. I'm also a 40 year resident of Codman Square. Uh, I appreciate being here and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to provide some testimony today. Uh, I'd like to say that the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and ADSL have a very storied relationship. You'd think that two organizations located maybe one mile from each other would be in direct competition with one another. And really that couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club started in 1974, ADSL started in 1983. And since that time, and in my memory, there has always been a generous collaboration between our two organizations. Way before I came on the ADSL scene, Mike Joyce, the Senior Vice President of Operations, who also happens to be a Dorchester institution, uh, was part of the ADSL board, um, and he continues to serve as clerk and my mentor uh, to this day. ADSL wo works uh, very closely with the Boys and Girls Club leadership through an effort supported by Children's Hospital, and not to mention the sharing of coaches, sports equipment, and enrichment supplies for us over the years. But the reason for this bit of history is that where I sit, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester is ultimately here to make the Dorchester community a better place for all our kids and families, no matter where they live in Dorchester. Clearly, they have done an outstanding job in this part of Dorchester, and I'm so excited to see what the larger footprint of the Dorchester Fieldhouse in Columbia Point will bring to the surrounding neighborhoods. And you don't need me, me to tell you there is a lot of development and investment in Dorchester these past few years. I think it's critically important that we don't forget our families who reside in this part of Dorchester. They are our most important asset. They are the future of this part of Boston and it's imperative that they are provided with state-of-the-art resources 
just like so many other neighboring communities so that they can lead successful, productive lives and contribute to this vibrant community. And it's no secret that the Boys and Girls Club provides desperately needed services for our families. I know this firsthand. While my children were growing up and needed after school and out of school resources, they landed at the Boys and Girls Club. By increasing the presence of Boss, the Boys and Girls Club in Dorchester in this way, and through the partnership with the Martin Richard Foundation, they'll be able to welcome many, many more youth into their programs in this brand new location. Dorchester deserves this, and thank you for supporting this amazing effort. Uh, thank, thank you, Candice, and thanks for all that ADSL does. Um, we have one more person who's joined the Zoom, so uh, going next to Brian Doherty. Kozla, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Kozla Block, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Baker, thank you for, for putting together this, uh, this hearing this evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just want to say it's great to be with you. Uh, my name is Brian Dari, and I represent, uh, with, along with a lot of colleagues who are, I'm going to speak on their behalf tonight, uh, the Boston Building Trade Unions. Uh, we're proud to be here as partners to the Boston, um, as the Boston Building Trade Unions with the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and the Martin Richard Foundation. Uh, the Martin Richard Foundation and the Boys and Girls Club are committed to our youth and to our parents. And what I mean by that is the building trades rep unions represent thousands of families across Boston. And just to give you some statistics, uh, over 2,400 families in Dorchester, over 1,200 in Roxbury, over 1,000 in Mattapan, over 1,000 in South Boston, and then thousands across Hyde Park, East Boston, and all of our neighborhoods. The reason we're on the call tonight is because we're always proud to, su to support and partner with people who care about our communities and everybody in them. Uh, but tonight's a pretty special night because of the incredible team that was there before you on this panel, uh, both the young and old alike, who are there dedicated day in and day out to serving our neighborhoods and strengthening them to make them better. Um, tonight, I just want to come on and say a couple of things. This project is going to be a good one, and we are proud to partner with them to make sure that every job on that site is a good job that pays fair wages and health care benefits and retirement benefits and provides training and opportunities for members of our community. Uh, but there's something specific I want to mention. I had the chance, and Candace, who is an incredible advocate in our community, was uh, someone I've worked with the past decade and a half in ADSL. And we've had the firsthand opportunity to see the magic that happens at the Boys and Girls Club in Dorchester and the incredible uh, outcomes that happen by all of the hard work everybody on, on site. Um, but just to say that we have multi-annual presentations every year where we go to Boys and Girls Club, tell them about careers in the trades, and then we have countless members who are now members of the Boston Building Trade Union, strengthening and building our communities. But one of the things I want to key in on tonight, and it just keeps coming up in the work that we do in the unions, is we have great health care, and we're proud of that. But the number one call that we're getting, the highest volumes of calls that we're getting, are for young people, the children of the members who work in the building trade unions, this, this, the young people who are struggling with anxiety, with depression, with psychological trauma, coming out of the past two years of this pandemic. And we're here tonight to say that an organization like the Boys and, Boys and Girls Club and the work that they do has to be replicated. It has to be resourced. We need more facilities like this uh, for Dorchester kids and for every kid from every part of our city uh, so they can have the resources and the help and the support that they need uh, to make it in our communities. So it, it's pretty simple for us as, as, a Boston, as Boston residents, as taxpayers, as folks who are committed to good government and partnering with all of our counselors to do this important work for our communities. Uh, we're, we we want to weigh in heavily and say that resourcing projects like this one resourcing this partnership and the great work that's done by all the great people we've heard from tonight is the right decision to use recovery money to help our communities. And we are just coming tonight to say uh, on record that we fully, fully support it. Uh, so thanks to everybody from Boys and Girls Club, the Martin Ridge Foundation, all of our counselors, uh, all of the young people who are there to testify, and everybody who's going to make this project uh, as great as it should be. And thank you again for the time tonight. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right, I think that concludes our public testimony. Um, so I just want to very quickly, because we're, we're rounding the corner towards 8 o'clock, and uh, folks have uh, maybe homework to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I guess I just wanted to explain a little bit as the chair sort of where we go next. So as Councillor Baker alluded to, um, there's about $350 million of, um, of uncommitted uh, American Rescue Plan funds on the city the city government side, there's another 
people may have heard there's another kind of um, 400 plus million on the on the BPS side, um, and but the the city funds come through this council, and so you know the administration uh, will and actually I think have on Monday, so it'll be formally coming into council tomorrow. Filed proposals for how to spend that money, um, and the council will be having a series of hearings, which we have to fit around the. Uh, many budget hearings that are coming up um, to kind of talk through, you know, what are the things that are on the table from the administration and what are the things that counselors want to bring to the fore in this process. And so we, we Councillor Baker brought this forward and we wanted to have this hearing tonight um, to before we launch into budget, but we'll, uh, we'll be having more hearings kind of following up on both the administration proposals and proposals from colleagues and kind of making sure that um, the public has an opportunity to weigh in the way that you all have tonight, um, and and that we can really make sure that we're we're spending these one-time funds in a truly transformative way. Um, so uh, that's you know more to come, um, but I really appreciate you guys modeling for us tonight what it looks like for the community to get involved and make its voice heard on how it wants to see these funds used, and just know that. Um, the committee is going to be actively working with um, Councillor Baker and, and all our colleagues on this front. Um, so excited about the process ahead. And uh, and I will just briefly allow, I would encourage colleagues to be extremely brief, but I will allow uh, closing comments um, before we gavel out. So Councillor Baker. Thank you, Council Bach, for, um, for shepherding this here tonight. Congratulations, guys. I thought it was great. We, <clears throat> we, we shared a lot of information. You told us who who you are and what's important to you. Um, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I believe in you. I'm going to fight for you. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to do our part, put $10 million towards this, towards this field house. And again, this is generational. This isn't just about you guys. This is about people for the next 100 years. So, um, and, and thank you, Bob, and, every, and everybody else coming out here tonight. Um, you know, I, if you build a good building, it's 100 years, right? So, um, but again, congratulations, everybody. And, and I, I'm sure we'll, I think you made an impact on my colleagues tonight, which is what we wanted to do, to, to show you who we are, what, 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 how we advocate for ourselves. And thank you, guys. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Murphy? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this was very inspiring. My Auntie Kay and my mom started the first teen center in the city of Boston, so I don't need to be sold on how important community centers, boys and girls clubs are. I grew up in the gym at the Murphy. I learned how to swim in the pool there. It did not look like this. And I also was a teacher at the Dever School when my son was a student at BC High. And there were days when he wanted a ride home and he was leaving the you know, state-of-the-art football field or the state-of-the-art lacrosse field and cutting through the hole in the chain link fence to come into the parking lot over at the Dever McCormick to get a ride home for me. And I often thought, we can do this here. We have billions of dollars, like we spend a lot of money and our kids deserve it. So like you said, John, you're a student at BC High and you're part of the Boys and Girls Club. Our kids deserve this, so I am here to fight for that and just thank you again, Councillor Baker. And I also wanna say I noticed how wonderful you were supporting each other, the youth, youth advisory group. You all gave each other high fives. I know it's intimidating to speak here on the council floor and if you were nervous, I didn't notice, and I'm just so proud of all of you. And thank you for being so good to each other. That shows that this club has taught you a lot, lessons that you will have forever. So thank you to Bill and Mary and everyone at the club and everyone involved in this. This is very exciting, and we're gonna make this happen. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lujan. Um, yeah, I echo my colleagues' comments, and I just thank everyone from the Boys and Girls Club from uh, the Mario Richard Foundation, everyone for just um, just the incredible work that you all are doing to make sure that 
uh, we're building facilities for young kids that really affirm their dignity and how we feel about you, which is that you guys are all diamonds and deserve the world. And regardless of where you live or what your zip code is, and that sometimes because of your zip code, we need to invest more in all of you. Um, I, you guys are all, you all are rock stars. And so hearing you testify, um, you know, means I got to set my game up when I'm speaking here on city council. So thank you for setting the bar really high, especially to my fellow McCormick kids. Um, so much love, right? Um, and so much brilliance in our public school students that we have to work to bring out. You know, I, as a McCormick kid, McCormick introduced me, as I said, to basketball, but the Boys and Girls Club is what made me, I was a, I was a ball girl for the Boston Celtics rookie team at UMass Boston via the Boys and Girls Club. And so I know the importance of working together in partnership, uh, public schools, in partnership with private organizations, including nonprofit organizations, to really meet the full needs of our of our students, so that we can address, uh, so that we can really make sure we're building whole people and whole adults. So I just thank you for being here, um, and I look forward to the conversations we'll have on the council to to getting this work done. So thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Franley Shatterson. I'll keep it brief because I know there's like four of us that's like really hungry and we got to go eat. <laughs> um, so, wow, what an impressive presentation. Um, really, thank you. And Ron Burton Training Village, actually my son attended uh, the Ron Burton Training Village a couple of years in a row and I'm very familiar with the Burtons and friends. And I, if you are incorporating that and I'd like to learn how, what is the partnership, if you are co incorporating their curriculum in your program, it is truly life-changing and transformative. I, I can testify to that. Um, and my, my children, I think, were more shy and more reserved, um, but this place really talks about, you know, spirituality, and they run seven miles, I think, at five or four in the morning every single day. Um, Harborston Mass is beautiful, but if we, if this connection is with them, I, I really want to learn about that. In terms of inclusivity, um, I really appreciated the Miss Amanda. Sorry, Danielle. Um, her presentation about um, inclusivity in terms of you know different learning um, abilities. Um, I I provided services to um, special needs uh, for about seven years, and um, everyone knows that ABA services are very hard and far in between to find. And if you are allowing that, and then the other thing is the culture piece. Um, I think that for us um, Muslim girls, we don't swim uh, in co-ed pools. So I'm looking forward to understanding how you're addressing sort of cultural appropriacy and accommodating folks in different ways. Um, look forward to hearing more. Uh, great job, uh, Councillor Bach and Councillor Baker. Thank you for bringing us this to us. Um, I just want to, the one thing that I heard tonight that sums it all up for me, my man Elvis over here, he said, let's add to the goodness of the world. So Elvis, let's add to the goodness of the world. Thank you everybody for coming out. You guys are rock stars. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Um, like I said, yeah, like everyone said, I think the future is bright with you all uh, leading the way. So um, thank you for being here with us tonight. And with that, at 7.53, um, this hearing of the Boston City Council's Committee on COVID-19 Recovery is adjourned. <laughs>